Here is audio sound check. One, two, three, four, five. Here is audio sound check.
I can go up here and then there'll be somebody up here. Yeah. So, uh, Gens is going to present from the podium. So, if you want to present from the podium, wait, sorry, say again. You can either present from the podium or the chair. When you didn't hear, can we, uh, how do you control the slides? I'm going to this side. Thank you. 
You don't have any responsibilities. You might be the moderator. You can do it. Yeah, you know, I think Go ahead. Yeah, I thought you were doing that, Michael, but I have to give it a Don't, uh, yeah. Go for it. That's the thing I've heard on. Yeah. Well, the Garrett's looking at me. Yeah, I mean, we'll go there. No people are wondering. Yeah, uh, we're, we're making progress. Yes. Um, uh, Sean McGuire, I think, probably wants to talk to all three of you about what to do about Black Harbor strategically. And where's the click, click, thing? He uh, says the Clean Air Fund is thinking about engaging with the human decision about Black Harbor. And I was talking to him about the radiant for global radiant forcing changes in right. AR6. And, the much more significant regional impacts. He'd, he'd like huge demerit, but, you know, opportunity. But in general, the United States has yeah. never cared about that issue, right? So, no, um, anyways, the, he'd like to powwow a little bit, I think, um, and, and brainstorm on that. I didn't know the microphone was on. Good morning, everyone. We are about to begin. Uh, we just want to say, maybe save a little extra time. Um, oh, the bell is ringing. Okay, good. We're gonna we're gonna wait a minute or two and see if we can get a few more people in. Good morning. You guys are, are you going to go, all go up to the podium or you? Yeah. Okay, we should be set then. Hello. Good morning uh, again. Uh, welcome to this third day of the Climate and Clean Air Conference 2023. Uh, my name is Nathan Borgford Parnell, the Science Affairs Coordinator of the CCAC. If you've been in any of the other sessions for the previous two days, you may have seen me before. Um, I have to say this is my absolute favorite day of any of the CCAC conferences. I hope that it will be your favorite day. And the reason it's my favorite day is because it's the science policy dialogue day and uh, I'm the science coordinator for the CCAC so I have the absolute pleasure of working quite regularly with the the luminous scientific community and scientific advisory panel that we have in the CCAC it is probably one of the well I'm a little bit biased when I say this but I think it is probably the greatest resource that, that our coalition has um and 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 I and I have to say that's based on uh, me having 
coordinated the SAP since since 2014. Um, I have a, a long long history of an experience with this group. Um, so this morning, uh, in in the interest of trying to get as many people here as possible, um, I, I set us up with a very exciting agenda. Uh, the the opening session of this science policy dialogue today is a primer on short lived climate pollutants. Uh, this is a hopefully a a reintroduction for those of you who have been with us for many years. Hopefully a reintroduction and uh, and uh, and a reeducation on uh, some of the fundamentals of of why we are working on short lived climate pollutants uh, from a scientific perspective, as well as an update on on some of the newest scientific findings, uh, research and publications um, on topics related to integrated climate clean air and, and SLCP mitigation. Uh, and for those of you who are new to the coalition, uh, we're hoping that this will be a crash course uh, for you. Uh, this morning, we have four distinguished presenters. Each one will be giving a 15 minute presentation on a particular topic, and then it will be followed hopefully, well, now, given where it's 9.08, uh, maybe maybe slightly less than 30 minutes of question and answer period, uh, but we'll try to reserve as much time as possible for Q&A. And, and I really do welcome, I think actually I'll speak on all of their behalf. I, we really do welcome your questions because um, this is a, an incredibly complicated topic. Uh, so uh, first on the docket is our chair of the scientific advisory panel, uh, Dr. Drew Schindel from Duke University. He's going to be giving an, uh, an overview of short-lived climate pollutants. He will be followed by Chandra Venkantaraman. I've been practicing that this morning. Hopefully I, would, I did well there. Uh, um, and also on our scientific advisory panel, she'll be speaking about regional impacts of warming aerosols in South Asia. Uh, then will come Kenza Komsi, uh, who will speak about regional impacts of black carbon in Africa. And finally, Eric Zussman, uh, who will speak about solutions and transition pathways and implementation for SLCPs. So I will now get out of the way. Drew, I'm very excited and uh, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm going to try to walk you through very quickly quite a lot of information about short-lived climate pollutants and then allow my colleagues from the SAP to, to fill in some of the things that I don't have time to, to give adequate treatment for. So I'm going to talk first at the most basic level about the short-lived climate pollutants and what these are. Um, the climate forcers that are very strong Right? They not, might not be as numerous as something like CO2, but they are very powerful. They're also air pollutants, and that's why, naturally, we're the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. And they don't last so long, right? which means they have different impacts than those of the long-lived uh, greenhouse gases like CO2 or nitrous oxide. The main compounds that we're interested in within the C CCAC are methane, uh, black carbon, product of incomplete combustion that virtually never comes out alone, other than perhaps kerosene wick lamps, which there's an example of over there on the right. But nearly all of the black carbon sources emit many other things as well, which I'll return to. And hydrofluorocarbons, not all of which are short-lived, but many of which are. When you look at the impacts of something like poor air quality, in particular fine particulate matter, we know that this is killing many, many millions of people around the world every year. We heard somebody refer to it as the, the there's both a, a climate emergency and an air pollution emergency. Uh, it is the number one cause of premature death for women and children in many parts of the developing world. But that doesn't mean it's only a problem in the developing world. And so I have, I won't go through them all, but I have some of the results that the US government uses when we evaluate the effects of regulation. And we know that there are many, many effects beyond simply people dying early. There are kids that can't go to school. There are parents that have to stay home and care for either their children, care for elderly populations. There are people that can't go to work. And there are many things that we are unable to quantify. Even though we have this long list, we also know that things like cognitive development and loss of IQ points and dementia, many other impacts of air pollution are present, but we're not able to quantify. So there's a huge raft of health impacts. There also, you can see that graph there, or the picture at the right, shows some plants um, exposed to ambient air, 
with high levels of ozone and happens to be in Pakistan. And then when the air is clean, the plants grow better. What that means is that, well, if you think of something like methane and how methane has affected climate, if you look at the IPCC reports, it's been about two thirds as much impact on warming to date as CO2. All right, CO2 is the big elephant in the room, methane is number two. If you look at the effect on agriculture, however, CO2 fertilizes plants, right? It causes heat and climate change and some areas have drought. And yet part of the damages due to climate change are offset by CO2. In the case of methane, not only are you not fertilizing them, you're making ozone. And so it's the other way around rather than, than CO2 being the biggest one in the room, we have pretty good reason, not these exact numbers, but to believe that uh, methane is a bigger contributor to agricultural losses than CO2. So the CCAC has tried for, for a long time now to produce uh, sometimes somewhat complicated graphs that include a lot of information, like this one, where we look at different possible futures. And, and the real idea here is not only to convey that there are multiple benefits, which is over there on the right, but that there are a lot of different possible ways our emissions might evolve. And that really, if we just tackle long-lived greenhouse gases, in particular, if we decarbonize and get rid of CO2, that is extremely helpful, but it is not adequate. If we just tackle SLCPs without tackling CO2, again, extremely helpful, but not adequate. The only way we actually keep down to the kind of temperatures we want is if we do both. But when we do both, we get benefits at different timescales. The CO2 gives us the benefits over the long term. The short-lived climate pollutants are really what gives us relief in the near term. What's also illustrated here is that there is the possibility of, of delaying short-lived climate pollutant actions. And we get in the long term to a fairly similar temperature response. Some people have used that to argue that maybe we don't Maybe it's not so urgent. Maybe we should deal with decarbonization right away and put off SLCPs. Well, the timing matters because SLCPs are not just affecting climate. They're affecting well-being, especially public health, but also many more SDGs, which we'll hear about in a moment. Even from the climate point of view, mitigating warming early matters. Why? Because people are already suffering because there are things like bioecological bio systems trying to adapt, and they can only adapt if the warming is kept at a slower pace, right? So slowing the pace over the next 30 years might allow many ecosystems that would otherwise be pushed over the edge to survive while we try to simultaneously decarbonize right away, but those benefits again are deferred. There are also things like how much the, the glaciers and ice sheets melt is a function of the cumulative warming. So warming now is not the same as mitigating warming later. And of course, public health impacts are not at all the same. Here's, a, here's an example published about nine years ago where this team looked at the impact of reducing SLCPs early versus late getting almost the same climate trajectory in the long run, but 45 million more people died from air pollution along the way, right? So it might all be all the same to you if the only thing you care about is climate in 2100, if you're one of those 45 million people or people relying on that billion tons of crops that would be lost without SLCP mitigation, it probably makes a, quite a big difference. So what do we do to get rid of these things? Well, for black carbon, it's always, as I mentioned, the measure and focusing on BC rich sources. Right? The, SLC, the CCAC has for a long time emphasized that it's not all black carbon. It is black carbon that comes out in a more rich B, black carbon to OC, BC to OC ratio. And that tends to be things like diesel vehicles are one of the biggest sources. There are some, some sorts, some sources of burning, not all burning, not say wildfires, seems to have a more climate neutral effect. Uh, but when you add in the effect of carbon monoxide, which comes from incomplete combustion, generates ozone, uh, along with the black carbon, you can find that in many cases of BC rich sources, the net effect of the warming agents offsets the net effect of the cooling agent or more than offsets it so that reducing them really can mitigate warming. I've got a picture there in the upper right of a of a diesel 
uh, heavy duty truck and you can see that that smoke pouring out of the exhaust is pretty darn black, right? So there might be some organic carbon in there too that's light colored, but mostly it's pretty dark. And then there's a woman cooking on a traditional cook stove, which again, one of the major sources of indoor as well as ambient air pollution is in developing countries. And there's a woman in Senegal where the government has has subsidized and provided LPG for modern cooking. And so she gets the same service uh, without the same exposure to either air pollution or the same climate impact. If we look at things like a report that CCAC did on, on sustainable development control uh, goals, controls on emissions linked to sustainable development goals, which again, we'll hear more about, these are not exclusively short-lived climate forcing measures, but you can reduce a lot of pollutants, including something like black carbon could drop by 70%, HFCs, methane, and then there's some drop in CO2 as well. But these really dramatically reduce air pollution exposure while at the same time uh, reducing warming. So there's a lot of co-benefits that can be achieved when you consider health and climate together. Many of our analyses are not solely focused on SLCPs, but have this broader development, sustainable development agenda um, underlying the, the choice of emission controls. When we'll hear more about this from, from Ken's in a moment, but we, we looked in the Africa assessment that CCAC just released the executive summary of last, last, uh, COP. And we found things like this, this graph there at the right, where there was a pronounced drying in much of North Africa, Northern tropical Africa, um, under the baseline scenario. And when we put into place the agenda 2063, something that the African Union uh, commission has put together as the future that we want in Africa. We found that the reduction in pollution could substantially reduce that projected drying. One of the things that's really powerful about this is that if you look at Africa's emissions, Africa emits a tiny fraction of global greenhouse gases. So if Africa goes all out on mitigating CO2 versus not going all out on mitigating CO2, almost nothing whatsoever happens to temperature. And you think, well, that's that's kind of discouraging. That means whatever Africa does, they don't really have any control of their future, right? It turns out that was not the case. So we probe this much more deeply. This is a graph from a paper that's actually just come out this past weekend. And we've shown that it's really, I won't go through the details, but it's really the reduction in aerosols from Africa that averts that drying, right? So this is another rationale for the focus on short-lived climate pollutants, and in particular, the BC-rich measures. Those aerosols get up there. Remember the dark smoke from the diesel, right? They get up there, they absorb sunlight, and they change the weather patterns. Even if they have a relatively modest effect on global mean temperature, and we found that Africa going all out to control their pollution could have very little impact on temperature, there are other things that are important. I would argue much more important than temperature for climate, and that's things like rainfall. And so if we found a really encouraging result here, which is that Africa has agency. Africa can control its climate future much more than we thought, at least in the important, most important factor of how much rainfall they get. Temperature is up to the rest of the world acting. I want to say the last few bits about methane. Methane is unfortunately uh, continuing to rise at actually the last three years have been record rates of growth in the atmosphere. We know that it's responsible for a, a large fraction of current warming, as I mentioned earlier, and we have made a lot of progress, right? Just a couple of years ago, we did not have a worldwide group pushing to reduce methane. Now we have the Global Methane Pledge. Mm -hmm. This is a huge amount of progress in the political sphere, has to be followed up by actually getting the atmosphere to change. The atmosphere is still going the wrong direction. But we can do that because we looked in the global methane assessment that CCAC uh, released in 2021, and we found that like all of the things we talk about, that these measures that control methane lead to multiple benefits. A bunch of them are listed up there, but it's not just climate, it's asthma, it's premature mortality, it's agriculture. All of these things are achievable and we laid out a path to keeping methane at levels consistent with 1.5 degrees, which 
emphasizes controls in the fossil fuel sector, but extends to also agriculture and waste because they are important sectors. They all have measures that can be put into effect. Decarbonization alone won't get them done. Right? So we need to keep pursuing decarbonization. We need the UNFCCC framework. We need that to be successful, but we also need to supplement it with our own work. And if we do that, uh, this one shows that the, the costs are actually relatively modest. Relatively, I say, because there's still issues with the cost, but many of them are negative because you capture the methane, you use it to, say, generate electricity. It can pay for itself. Many are low cost. All of this, though, is just the market cost, right? If you actually add in a, a price associated with environmental damages, then all of these would pay for themselves. That's not the way the real world tends to work. Uh, when I tend to talk to people about methane control measures and the fact that many pay for themselves, many people give me this strange look and say, that can't be because then logically, you know, they wouldn't still be there. Well, here's an example, right? Some of this great satellite data that we're starting to see from remote sensing where people have overlaid here. Some This is from the United States, right? These are coming from pipelines. These are deliberate. These are people wanted to work on the pipelines. And so they vented out all the gas rather than pumping it downstream. Right. Here's another example where they're flaring from an oil field when it was controlled by one of the big majors, which has a presence out to the public, so cares. They sold it to a private, e private equity firm, and suddenly huge amounts of released methane because they don't really care about their reputation. Right? So much of this stuff is done willfully just because it's simpler. We have, uh, therefore, a need for regulation beyond just saying, oh, it pays for itself, so, so you should go ahead and do it. We know it has to be done, though. That was that was laid out back in the original assessment that helped catalyze the formation of the CCAC back in 2011. We have measures in fossil fuel, in agriculture, in waste. We can put them all together and get us on the road to 150 megatons of reduction, what we need relative to the baseline to reach the target of the Global Methane Pledge. And I would just conclude by saying SLCPs are really vitally important to those people who are already suffering because they are the leverage that we have over the next couple of decades. They are important to providing additional time for both humans and natural systems to adapt before we shoot right past our targets. They are important to preventing uh, health damages associated with um, and agricultural damages associated with air pollution. Tackling in the near term and the long term are obviously important for the welfare of humanity over multiple generations. Thank you very much. And I'm going to turn it over to our next speaker. So thank you, Drew, and it's uh, great to have the background and and clarity that you've provided on the primer to SLCPs to get started here. Um, waiting for my first slide. So I uh, am going to speak to you about regional impacts in South Asia. And as we've been talking about climate change over the last uh, a few days, uh, the fact that we use global mean metrics in order to come up with reasons to drive policy. However, the impacts of climate change are experienced on regional and uh, local scales. And I will talk about South Asia. Um, this has already been said by Drew that uh, if based on current action, the amount of levels of emissions that we will have of climate warmers in 2030 far exceeds, and there's a huge emission gap, the safe levels of emissions that are needed to stay uh, within the 1.5 degree centigrade target, and that these warmers include greenhouse gases as well as short-lived climate pollutants. And with short-lived climate pollutants, we have the amazing opportunity that because they are in the atmosphere for much shorter times, the moment we cut the emissions, we are able to remove them from the atmosphere and slow the warming trajectory. So um, specifically, the talk is about aerosols, and we've been talking about pollution particles of PM 2.5, as the air pollution community uh, understands them, in the context of air pollution and its various uh, human health and ecosystem uh, damages that it causes. Um, 
These particles interact with radiation. They have different constituents, black carbon, as uh, Drew has highlighted, um, strongly absorbs radiation and emits heat. And therefore, it's a very strong warmer as well. Um, there are other acidic species like uh, sulfates, nitrates, organics, etc., which essentially scatter radiation. Now, in many world regions, uh, the aerosol is predominant in these acidic and organic species and therefore exerts a cooling effect. However, in the Indian region, we have these mixtures of sooty black carbon and dust aerosols. And so the question is, how are these affecting regional um, climate variables. And this includes, of course, um, temperatures as well as rainfall, which are very important um, in regional contexts. So if we look at um, over India, climate change has been driving an increase in the frequency, the number of days of occurrence, and the intensity of the amount of temperature that is there um, in, in terms of high temperatures or temperature maxima. So what's being shown in the top is between 1960 and 2010 or so, mean summer temperatures, March, April, May, June, before the monsoon sets in, have been rising. And uh, below, there's about a 20% increase in the number of hot days. So heat wave doesn't have a unique definition. However, in general, it uh, several consecutive days with temperatures, particularly a daily maximum temperatures, well above averages. So in 2015, for example, what's shown on the top right is uh, a heat wave, which unfortunately uh, took away 2,500 lives in India and another 1,500 lives in Pakistan. And uh, during the heat wave period, there were very, very enhanced temperatures. So... Um, while there are climate change and large scale drivers of heat waves, we wanted to see what were the local drivers. And uh, therefore, we went and uh, looked at a connection with pollution particles or aerosols. And um, in a heat wave, exposure to heat stress can lead to anywhere from minor illnesses, um, nausea, headache, etc., to worsening existing uh, illnesses in humans, increased hospitalization, and even death. And um, the lack of access to good habitat, uh, being forced to work in outdoor occupations, or lack of access to enough drinking water, all of these worsen our exposure to heat stress. So here what we're showing is that um, warming particles, which are uh, detected by satellite, called the absorbing aerosol index, and the temperature maxima in northwest India, both rose over um, 35 years, between 1979 to about 2013 is when the data set ended uh, when we did this study. We used statistical approaches to try and understand the connections between uh, enhancements in warming aerosols and heat waves and found surprisingly that the enhancements in warming aerosols in the northwest increase temperatures in the northwest, the local effect, but also a non-local effect that uh, enhancements in the aerosols in central India, which is shown as a patch in brown in central India, uh, correlated very well with Northwest India um, temperature maxima. And um, we found that this happens not just correlationally, but also uh, there's a statistical technique to establish causality with the aerosol levels going up, followed one to five days uh, by the temperature maxima levels also following and going up several times in the season. And uh, so we found temperature maxima increases between a tenth of a degree centigrade to 1.6 degrees centigrade and something like a half a degree centigrade or two days increase in heat wave duration can drive mass heat wave related deaths. So these could be rather dangerous occurrences. So here I'll need uh, the animation, please. So we're looking at the heat wave of 2015, and on the left, temperature maxima, black carbon concentrations of the heat wave region, the browns, are showing that there's a period from late May 
till about June 5th, where both uh, maximum temperature and black carbon concentrations were increasing coincidentally. And uh, we looked for the underlying mechanisms that essentially uh, the increased black carbon at the surface then absorbs radiation and emits heat. The temperatures of the ground were warmer and that heated the air as well as you had drier soils. So you had less evaporation and cooling. Um, so this was um, in simulations with a climate model with and without black carbon effects so with without actually the entire aerosol radiative effect. So it shows that the aerosol itself can drive up these temperatures by of the order of uh, anywhere from a tenth to two degrees centigrade, as uh, similar to what we saw in the observations. Another sort of interesting and new finding is that following the dry heat stress period, we talked about humid heat being important and the fact that temperature and humidity together um, worsen a heat stress due to what is called moist heat stress because the body cannot perspire and cool itself efficiently. And so uh, following this period from um, June 7th till about the end of June, we had the combination of temperature and humidity, which is being shown as wet bulb temperature here, um, being driven up. And uh, it just shows that the wet bulb temperature shifted to a higher uh, level. And this, in fact, uh, in the 2015 heat wave, the Pakistani heat wave was affected much more by humidity increases, but we see that over here for the Indian heat wave as well. Um, the other uh, very important regional uh, climate phenomenon is, of course, the monsoon. In fact, it's perhaps uh, more important even uh, than temperatures because the economy of India relies on it heavily uh, with rain-fed agriculture. And what's being shown on the right plot is in blue, looking at the mean rainfall in the core monsoon zone um, in 1981 to about, um, so this is in the previous period, 1951 to 80, the 30-year period where we're showing 11 millimeter per day. And the, the future period, which was 81 to 2011, it's come down to eight millimeters per day. So there is a decrease from 1950s to present day in the uh, rainfall during the peak monsoon period in the in the core monsoon zone. Rainfall changes are attributed to climate change affecting circulation patterns, as well as the amount of moisture inflow from ocean onto the land. And various factors have been identified, including ocean warming in brown below, including uh, land use land cover, tree and uh, crop cover. Uh, as they reduce, it increases the reflectivity of the earth system, which is called earth albedo, and then increasing aerosol levels. So what we tried to do was to isolate the aerosol effects, both observationally and in models. So here in the observational studies, um, we're showing clusters of regions which have high aerosols and low rainfalls. So we uh, clustered them with high aerosols, low rainfall, low aerosol, low rainfall, and, and the, other uh, the other two, and looked specifically at the high aerosol, low rainfall regions. And once again, used the same statistical techniques and found both um, correlational and causal relationships with increases in aerosols uh, leading to periodic decreases in rainfall for several days during the monsoon period, which is June, July, August, September. And uh, in these uh, regions, we had a greater number of monsoon breaks. So a monsoon break is also not uniquely defined, but break spells are typically defined as three days or more with less than one millimeter per day of rainfall. And these increased monsoon breaks, particularly the longer breaks of seven days or more, can uh, really uh, lead to rainfall deficits, water availability issues, and so on. And it was an aerosol effect which reduced the upward flow of moisture that we identified as the effect here. 
And uh, so coming to the last final slides, here, of course, is uh, once again a modeling study where we found the same effects of uh, um, an intensification of drying and a drying of the extremes. And now to the opportunity, the opportunity to target uh, mitigation and uh, looking at the same kind of framework that CCAC used for the Asia and Pacific Air Pollution Report. Um, don't worry about everything on the left. It's a set of ongoing programs which we've tried to pass into uh, what are the ones which are in the formal sector, which is electricity generation, transport and industry that are the climate and environmental priorities for the, the country and then the ones of development priority in the informal sectors related to um, household energy to um, brick production, agricultural, agriculture, and so on, agricultural residue burning. So what we find here is, of course, that the largest short-lived climate pollutant uh, reductions are obtained by the interventions in the informal sectors, while um, CO2 reductions are, of course, uh, based in the formal sectors over uh, 80%. But when we see that, you know, we're delivering 1.4 gigaton CO2 reduction by 2030. I'm sorry, the slide is missing the fact that it's 2030 um, control scenarios compared to 2015 baseline. Um, there is a great potential to deliver um, between 0.7 and 2.4 gigaton CO2 equivalent reduction from SLCPs and a very large reduction in PM 2.5 or air pollution um, reduction. So I'll stop here with essentially the message that uh, prioritizing informal sector interventions can deliver rapid um, climate and clean air uh, benefits in the Indian region. Good morning, everybody. Um, I am Kenza. I'm from Morocco. I belong to the scientific advisory panel of the CCAC, and I want to thank Nathan for the praise he did for us in the beginning. And it's a real pleasure to talk after Drew, who gave uh, the story, the general story of the short-lived climate pollutants, and after Chandra, who gave the story of the aerosols in South Asia. And I will be giving the story of black carbon in Africa, talking about regional impacts and uh, some solutions and mitigation measures. And in fact, talking about Africa, Africa is um, the oldest country. It is very known by the diversity, diversity of topography, geography, population, traditions, history, language, and lots of, uh, lots of diversities within it. And in fact, it is a moving country. It is a moving continent and it is, um, progressing continent. And that's why the continent is facing a uh, lot of environmental challenges. And black carbon is one of these environmental challenges. And in fact, black carbon, which is uh, an aerosol, uh, particulate matter, fine particulate matter, and it is, um, in fact, uh, appear from incomplete combustion of fossil fuels. Uh, and, and also it is coming from energy household and it is coming from the... Um, the industry um, and, and different other sources, transportation and other sources. And in fact, it has a short atmospheric lifespan and can travel in the uh, in long distances in the atmosphere. And it has original impacts on air quality, on climate, and then in health. And that's why addressing uh, black carbon in uh, in in the different uh, mitigations efforts of climate change and equality are very important. And basically, this is what the Africa Integrated Assessments tried to do. And this slide is not uh, unfamiliar. Yesterday, it was uh, introduced by Kevin. And in fact, the Integrated Assessment gathered different. Uh, interested parties, different stakeholders, scientists to talk about the situation in Africa with regards to climate air pollution and try to suggest different mitigation measures based on different agenda, the short-lived climate pollutant agenda with mitigation measures focused on this. And mitigation measures aiming at agenda 2063, which is the based on the or focusing on the Africa we want. 
And in fact, the assessment started with the bad news, which is the current situation. What is the current situation in Africa with regards to black carbon? So here you can see the, the, the trends in the emissions in the table below. And you can see that between 2018, which is the baseline, and 2063, um, black carbon is doubling in terms of emissions. And in the curves on, on the app, you can see that there is uh, the, the main sectors that are behind uh, the emission of black carbons in Africa. And the first one is uh, household uh, sector or household air pollution, which is behind. And in fact, it was in 2018, the household air pollution was the, the largest sector that is given black carbon in Africa. And this is changing and decreasing because there is a transition toward cleaner cooking in the country and then in the continent, sorry, and there's a, and then the household uh, uh, air pollution is, or sector is followed by transportation, electrical generation and industry. And then here uh, you can see that um, the, 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 the trends in black carbon emissions by region. So East Africa and West Africa are the champions followed by uh, by uh, Central Africa and Southern Africa. Meanwhile, in North Africa, it is not as, as much challenging as the other regions because the, the transition towards uh, gas cooking was already or happened already with population in North Africa. And in fact, this, uh, this, this differences in regions is coming from the diversities and disparities within regions, this is for sure. And also because there are disparities uh, in the natures of urban centers and rural areas. Then what is the impact? So the impact on health, we will start with this and uh, sure, uh, it's, it's through the impacts related to PM 2.5 through respiratory diseases and cardiovascular diseases. And this is impacting mostly vulnerable population, children and women and all people that stay most of their time at home. And also it impacts other parts or organs of the body, like the eyes. And on the graph, you can, or the different graphs, you can see the mortality coming from PM 2.5 and uh, in the different regions. And this is the trend between 2018 and 2063. And in most the regions, the trend of the mot mortality doubled. Uh, except in North Africa, when, where it increased by 25%, but it was already one of the highest in the region, or it was already high. So here you see the uh, deaths, the premature deaths from the household air pollution, and uh, again by region, and again, uh, 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 West and East regions are the champions here. But Anyways, even taking the baseline, so it is decreasing because, as I mentioned in the beginning, there is a transition in towards uh, uh, clean uh, cooking in the region. Some uh, uh, numbers. So in 2019, in Africa, more than 1 million premature deaths were attributable to air pollution. And household air pollution accounted for more than 600,000 deaths. And uh, also the PM 2.5, including black carbon, was responsible for 196 billion lost IQ points in African children. And also the household air pollution attributable uh, burden is the highest in sub-Saharan Africa. More information here. So uh, black or like black carbon, which is included in PM and PM was associated with the uh, adverse infant lung function outcomes in the first uh, two years uh, of life in, in South Africa for the, the infant. And also household air pollution was associated with eye uh, irritations and problems in Kenya, Hanoi and other African cities. And also scientific evidences uh, were found for the association between household air pollution and cataract uh, in Ethiopia and in Burkina Faso and in Tanzania. So this is to say that there are lots of um, impacts uh, on, on, on health of plant carbon. So we have seen the impact on air quality. We have seen the impact on, uh, on health. And now let's see the impact on climate as well. So this is uh, an illustration that, that, is, uh, that is available on the sixth reports from the IPCC, and it is talking about the impacts of black carbon. So this is what is in the rectangle in uh, green. So it's talk, it talks about the impacts of uh, black carbon as aerosol on the uh, effective radiative worsen and also in uh, the global uh, mean temperature. And in fact, uh, carbon, black carbon is impacting the 
uh, radiative force in throw two uh, main ways. So uh, direct ways, which is through aerosols, and indirect, which is through, uh, through aerosol radiation, I want to say, and indirect, the indirect, which is through the interaction aerosol cloud. And in fact, the um, the effective radiative force in is uh, positive when it's uh, when it's about uh, air, when we, it's about the direct impact or, air, or the black carbon as aerosol and sure it is impacting or it has impacted the temperature and contributed to the increase in temperature by 0 0.1 degrees C between 1750 and uh, 2019. So basically we talked about the block of bad news, the impact uh, on air quality, the impact on health and the impact on climate. Another thing that I want to mention is that the challenging characteristics of uh, black carbon and which is the uh, the ability to be transported and deposited. And here I gathered um, some evidences from the literature that mentioned this. So you can see the example of Dagar in Senegal and the kind of the air masses that are coming to the country from the northern east. And in fact, this is in the wet season and uh, different maritime aerosols are coming to the city and it is this, this uh, it is containing a, a load of, of uh, carbon aerosols. And uh, in fact, because this season is wet, so it is uh, the city is under the uh, threatening of the wet deposition. In the dry season, which is on the right, so again, the masses change the direction. So they are coming from the uh, northern east. And in fact, it is bringing um, aerosols from biomass burning uh, towards the country. So the same thing is repeating, uh, is repeating itself in, in the uh, left uh, graph, uh, left graph down, and this is in, in Rwanda, and then you can see that the trajectory of the masses is coming through the northeast, and it is um, it is uh, it is uh, passing uh, above the, uh, the 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 place of the fire uh, bend, and it is again bringing aerosols to the uh, to the to the country. The last graph in the down right is on Morocco, and you can see the. Uh, the flow that is coming to the country from the south through the Moroccan Sahara, and it is bringing uh, PM uh, and aerosols to the country. And in fact, on the Mediterranean, there is um, a band of pressure. So basically, when we have high pressure, this can create a blocking uh, situation and stagnation. And then all the PM and including black carbon is blocking over the country and can create uh, a deposition and then impact on the health. And if we don't have this high pressure area on the Mediterranean, Mediterranean, all the flow is going to the countries in the north and, and, and coming to Europe. So yeah, so the good news is that we finished the block of the bad news and we will move now to the good news and what did the assessment uh, talk about. So basically the assessment suggested 37 measures from different uh, categories of sectors, um, energy, transport, waste, agriculture, and industry as well. And in fact, uh, a branch of the language scientists work on the simulations, uh, focusing on these different measures. And again, I will show you the results after the simulations. And I just, I remind you, I remind you that this uh, assessment used different types of agendas, uh, mitigation measures focusing on SLCP towards 2030 and the agenda of Africa we want, considering all the greenhouse gases pollutions and this uh, in 2063. So starting from air quality, so you can see the different parts and there you can see the different um, agendas. So it's SCP agenda in 23 and 2063 and the Africa we want agenda in 23 and 2063. And in fact, for all the scenarios, we have a decrease uh, in the uh, emissions of black carbon that can reach in the best scenario, uh, 72%. Uh, percent. So in the uh, graph in the left, it is uh, it is uh, given by sector, and the the upper block is about 20, 2030, and the uh, black in the down is about twenty six to three. And then you can see that there is a decrease in black carbon emissions by sector. However, in twenty thirty, household air pollution will always take in the lead. Meanwhile, in twenty sixty three, there is a balance in the emissions coming from the different categories. 
Regionally speaking, same scenario is repeating itself. So you can see the largest bar, which is the baseline in 2063. And you can see the small bars, which uh, are given in 2063, the, uh, the, the, the SLCP measures and their impact on the, um, on the emissions from the different sectors in the different regions. And here I want to just mention that there will be in 2063, following the different uh, mitigation measures, there will be a change in the cartography of the emission sector. So, for example, in Central Africa, you can see that everything like the 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 category changed and and it's more we have black carbon more from the industry rather from the uh, other sectors meanwhile in 2063 uh, black carbon emissions will be uh, highly reduced from the uh, household uh, sector okay as for the climate so again a good news here and this is coming from the and this is coming from the study that was realized by Drew and uh, that he has just mentioned. And it is a brilliant study that is changing the this perspective of how we are seeing Africa and its climate, as he already mentioned. So basically, it is it was scientifically proved using models that have uncertainties as well that uh, African emissions, uh, basically the uh, aerosols were the primary cause of the Agenda 2063 scenario, reducing the drying or just reversing the drying in the northern hemisphere of uh, Africa when it is say, seen in the uh, baseline scenario. So here you can see in the uh, in the illustration in the up left, you can see the drying in the uh, brown uh, regions and you can see that there is um, uh, according to the baseline uh, decrease uh, projected decrease in, in in the precipitation and this in agenda 63 is kind of disappearing and uh, again we can uh, receive uh, some 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 precipitations and in the uh, graph in the right you can see the agenda 2063 versus the baseline and definitely this uh, the simulations show that uh, thanks to the aerosols, this uh, like less drying can happen, and even uh, we can see more precipitation. Okay, so this is about climate. Now for health, definitely uh, the uh, the outcome is positive. And first thing that I want to mention is that there will be a decrease in the uh, premature deaths coming from children and infant, and this is important to. To mention this is because of the change of the cartography of sectors as i mentioned and the fact that household air pollution is um is, is reducing its emissions from black carbon and uh, definitely in uh, using uh, the short-lived climate pollutant mitigation measures in 2030 there will be a decrease in the premature deaths by minus 20 percent from the adults and uh, children uh, deaths and by 2063, there will be a decrease uh, of uh, uh, 18,000 deaths that can reach more than, than uh, 50%. So yeah, so this is uh, this is the impact on health. And I want to thank you on the message that even though we have bad news, we can create our good news. And I, I definitely, if we consider this mitigation measures, we need to take more efforts to make this happen. And thank you so much for your friend. And Eric. Here, you move the air over here. Uh, let me try to set my eyesight once more time and go over here and see what it is. <laughs> yeah, that's too far away. Yeah, no, 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 it's all good. Hey, uh, so good morning, everybody. Uh, how's everybody doing today? Yeah, good, good, good. Okay, so, um, I'm going to uh, talk a, a little bit about um, transition pathways and uh, and just transitions. Apologies in advance to Nathan and colleagues for not using the proper uh, formatting for this, um, but uh, I'm trying to think a little bit outside the box, and so my presentation also reflects that. <laughs> All right, so um, without uh, further ado, uh, so I, I think, uh, as you've seen in, in many of the presentations already today, one of the primary objectives of uh, what we're trying to do in the CCAC um, is to create uh, a divergence uh, from business as usual uh, uh, emission pathways um, and uh, move from this uh, this black pathway to uh, this uh, green pathway. Um, 
And to do that, um, I mean, we've seen already uh, wonderful examples um, from across the world of many different types of solutions across uh, several key sectors, whether it be agriculture, transportation, uh, energy sector. Um, and uh, and many of these solutions, um, while there's, of course, some regional variation, um, many of these solutions have sort of a similar character and similar nature. A lot of the solutions tend to be um, small scale in, in, in nature. A lot of them are going to require um, not only technological changes, but also behavioral changes. Um, and a lot of them are going to require a little bit of push from finance and some awareness raising um, and capacity building um, to actually get some traction so that we can move from this high emissions pathway to this low emissions pathway. And what I would suggest to you um, is getting from one pathway to another, especially getting to that breaking point, is really, really hard. Um, and uh, one of the things that I want to underline is how do we basically get that divergence. So to do that, um, what I want to suggest is that there's a lot of challenges. Um, and those challenges might range from sort of technological challenges. So whether there's an availability of um, improved cook stoves, um, or if you want to switch over to LPG, whether there's actually access um, to, uh, to the li liquefied petroleum gas. Uh, some of those challenges are going to be financial in nature. Um, so whether or not uh, the technology is affordable um, or whether or not uh, the operating costs, whether or not you can invest in, you know, new fuels. Um, and then a lot of them are also going to be social and institutional in nature. So whether or not people are actually going to accept those new technologies, whether they have awareness of those new technologies. And then, as we've heard, I think, from many different colleagues, whether or not the government agencies have sufficient human resources, the right human resources, whether or not different agencies are working together um, within a certain level and then um, between different levels. So um, I don't mean to be pessimistic about this, and I promise you I will put an optimistic spin on things, but there are a lot of different challenges um, to getting from this sort of black line to this green line. And the other thing that I want to emphasize is these challenges, um, while I can sort of list them individually, they often work together to create what we sometimes call a lock-in effect. This idea of lock-in effect basically suggests that there might be um, interactions between these different challenges that sometimes create, um, you know, the, the, the terminology we use in English is inertia in the system, it creates um, connections between these different issues so that it becomes, you know, not just a matter of raising somebody's awareness, but also you need to raise awareness and also build capacity and also make sure you have access to technology. And so to break through this sort of lock-in, once again, is, is not going to be easy. Um, uh, so the question that comes up then is how do we get from this more um, high emissions pathway to the low emissions pathway. How do we get onto a more sustainable trajectory where we can break this lock in? And so now I have some good news for you. And the good news is, um, I mean, if you look uh, in the sustainability science literature, um, if you look, it's now starting to appear in the most recent IPCC reports. There's a lot of discussion on how do we um, go down transition pathways or how do we um, induce a sustainable transition? And so I'm going to first highlight some a key piece of literature on this, but then I'm going to try to simplify that a little bit. So that key piece of literature comes uh, from folks that focus on the call sustainability transitions. There's lots of different views on on how do you induce a sustainability transition. The approach that gets the a lot of the most attention is what's known as a multi-level perspective, um, and it's conceived by. Uh, sort of one of the founders is a professor from the University of Manchester named Frank Giels. Um, and basically uh, what he suggests is you need to actually promote change at different levels. He calls them the niche level, the regime level, and the landscape level. Now, um, that diagram that you can see before you um, uh, is quite complicated. I'm going to try to simplify that a, a little bit and then uh, apply it to some of the work that we do at the CCAC and also try to translate some of these concepts of niche, regime, and landscape. And so to do that, um, what I'm going to suggest to you is a lot of times when he's talking about changing things at the niche level, a lot of times this is some types of um, community-based or local innovation 
uh, where different networks of actors and stakeholders come together to promote change. Um, and uh, this is a lot of times very project focused, okay? And then when he talks about the regime level, a lot of times what he's talking about is changing different policies. So this could be anything from your NDC. It could also be your emission standards. Um, and he's also talking about changing institutions. So this could also be, this could focus on, for instance, changing the way that the air pollution division and the climate change division work together. Or once again, to get back to the previous point I raised, how national and local governments work together, and especially the coordination mechanisms that focus within and between levels of decision making. So he's talking about a lot of times policies and institutions. And then going up to the last level, what he calls landscape, there there's a few things that he's highlighting. The one that's going to be most prominent for today is what I would suggest changing science and norms. Okay. So changing ways that the sort of science frames decision making for uh, policymakers and also sort of the, the norms. What's sort of accepted has a, sometimes we call this the, the logic of appropriate. What's, what's considered appropriate? The way we under sort of understand the world. Um, and, you know, as with the CCAC, I think we've, we've changed some of the narrative, the, the norms on the way we look at, you know, these are, issues of air pollution and climate change. Now, what I would suggest to you then is to sort of get this divergence between these different pathways is then we also, we need to focus on projects, policies and institutions and changing the science. And I think this fits not quite nicely into, it's, you know, sort of a broader theory of change into what the CCAC is doing within different regions and also on a global level um, so that we get that divergence and break through these lock-ins. And this is just my interpretation of, of Giel's understanding of the world um, applied to the way the CCAC works. So when we talk about projects, a lot of this is really, this yellow box is really what's happening in, in our hubs. So we talk about the agricultural hub or the waste management hub, or if we talk about residential energy hub, a lot of that is, you know, relatively small scale project based activities where you have networks of stakeholders coming together to drive change on the ground. Then in this blue box right here, this is really where you have sort of, I would suggest the national planning hub. So the work that's being done, for instance, with the LEAP IBC model or with the GAINS model, a lot of that sort of co-design type of work that's being done to try to change policies and also to change institutions. I know there's been some efforts also to build capacities within different government agencies. So the national planning hub, I think, fits nicely in that blue box. And then the work that's going on in the SAP or some of these assessments comes up to this sort of red box. And so these are different, uh, what I would suggest, entry points and intervention points um, that the CCAC is targeting to promote transformative changes and to bring us from the sort of black pathway down to this green pathway and to break through some of the lock-in effects that I suggested previously. Um, and now the um, uh, last point I want to highlight, so just to show where that those three different boxes fit in the diagram. So this is sort of the way I see the CCAC working. Once again, the different types of solutions, different types of institutions, and the types of science, they might vary across different regions. But the basic sort of theory of change, I think, applies uh, more or less across the board. Um, now, the last point I, I really want to highlight is this gets this idea of, of just transitions. Um, and it gets into some social equity issues, which are gaining more uh, salience within the CCAC and also gaining a lot more attention uh, within climate policy discussions. Um, and what I really want to underline here is especially when we talk about some of the things that are happening at the um, regime level within our policies and institutions, um, we really need to, from my perspective, pay a lot more attention to some of the equity impacts. And I think there's sort of two views on these equity impacts that are really, really important that I want to stress. Um, one of them is the fact that um, sometimes the solutions that we implement, while they might deliver aggregate benefits, um, the distribution of benefits might be also very important. In fact, if we don't pay attention to the distribution of benefits, it might be difficult to implement those solutions. So I'm giving an example here from a case in Taiwan um, where there was a, a decision to ban uh, heavy duty uh, diesel vehicles that were over 10 years old. And there wasn't proper or what the, from the truck driver's perspective, there wasn't adequate consultation with the truck drivers, nor was there a, a compensatory mechanism put in place to make sure that they could purchase new trucks. It triggered a huge social protest um, and a lot of problems within the Taiwan EPA um, and a revision of the policy. 
Um, and still not everybody's happy about the decision. But I, I think that one of the key things that we really need to think about as we think about transitions is how to anticipate who might lose from certain policies, how can they be adequately compensated, and how can they engage in um, a social dialogue around some of those policies before their those impacts become a uh, point of contention and lead to protests and, and this type of thing. So it's anticipating who loses and, and making sure that they can actually enjoy the benefits of some of these changes. And that's not easy. This is, I'm don't want to sell that short. That's really challenging, but it's something we need to pay more attention to from my perspective. The other side of this is also to identify and empower potential winners, sometimes winners that might not be necessarily aware of the fact that they can gain from some of these changes. So here I want to highlight a project that we worked on a few years ago with the Asian Development Bank. And what we were trying to do is uh, we call it gender responsive climate policy, but it also applies to a lot of the work that CCAC does. And we were trying to empower women to become more engaged in climate mitigation activities. And in this case, we worked, uh, we worked in three different countries, but the picture you see before you um, was involved in um, uh, enabling women to set up their own um, biogas, biodigester uh, manufacturing companies. Um, and so they would help um, manufacture the biodigesters, but also manage the entire company um, and then make some linkages over to carbon finance and then also make some linkages to the at the higher levels. This is very much a project niche level type activity, but at the at the policy level as well, um, we did this. Uh, in uh, Donghoi City, so we also tried to influence the Donghoi City climate policy, as well as um, the the climate policy institutions within Donghoi to get more women engaged um, in the policy making process, and then use this project as a way to sort of demonstrate the different benefits there. So once again, identifying possible winners, empowering them, and then bringing them into your coalition of change, I think can also help to break through some of these lock in effects. Um, and then, you know, once again, move us from this black line down to this green line. Um, I'd like to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. And uh, apologies for the eye exam this morning. You obviously got a little bit of sleep last night. Um, wonderful. So thank you so much uh, to to all of the, the four presenters. We now have... Well, until the until the half hour for question and answer, I uh, I would also like to say that we have a critical mass of SAP members in the audience, and at least one emeritus SAP member who uh, I told when he left that uh, no one ever escapes the SAP. So uh, if any questions come up that maybe Harry is uh, best positioned to answer, I may call on him. Um, please uh, raise your hands if you have questions, and, and we'll go around the room, and I'll, I'll ask uh, that you introduce yourselves um, before asking your question. Ooh. Thank you. Um, Zig Klimon from uh, YASA, International uh, Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, Austria. Oops. Thank you very much for excellent presentations. Really, I enjoyed thoroughly the session. Um, I have a, two questions, or well, a question and a comment. I have a question to uh, Chandra about uh, black carbon impacts. You have mentioned uh, at least, I mean, many, but two highlighted, two of them affecting the um, heat waves, correlation between the concentration of black carbon and heat waves extent, and the other one also related to uh, to uh, monsoon, I was wondering about uh, evidence that would support an argument that it might aggravate also urban uh, pollution. So potentially extend so higher concentration of uh, remaining concentration of black carbon that would and the changes in boundary layer that would actually affect extent of air pollution episodes. Would you be able to comment on that? And 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 let me finish with a because then I will not pick up the microphone again comment to uh, Eric. Uh, thanks, Eric, for the outside of the box presentation. Uh, I, I was just wondering, it's the first time that I see a sustainable development path emissions that keep increasing, actually, uh, on your first slide. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Zig. Uh, interesting questions. Uh, 
So first clarification is that even though we called it black carbon, it's a mix of aerosols and it's the entire aerosol radiative uh, effect, which uh, is driving the heat wave just because the mixed aerosol happens to be warming in nature. And with the um, monsoon, it is both a radiative effect as well as uh, alteration of cloud effect. Um, so, yes, indeed, we did um, a study which is now available in atmospheric environment as to whether this radiative effect of aerosols, how it feeds back to PM2.5 and its constituents. Uh, indeed, on a, we didn't look at it at a city scale, but regionally over India. And yes, uh, there is an enhancement in pollution uh, which is regionally, spatially um, quite heterogeneous. And in some parts of North India and Western India, the increases can be as much as uh, 20%, uh, both in the pollution levels, uh, this is annual mean, and the related mortalities. So, uh, yes, that is an effect that uh, feeds back to air pollution. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I want to add to this the large scale uh, effect, and this is from Morocco. I'm not aware a lot about what is the, the general circulation impact in, in, in the Asia, but in Morocco, we have um, witnessed the increase in particulate matter 2.5, which, which is including black carbon and also heat waves. And this is basically from the uh, subtropical lifting, which is already hot coming to the country from the south. And then the fact that there is a stagnation over the country. So the uh, continuous nurturing with the warm flow and then the particulate matter that is coming from the to, with the flow from the south and then the stagnation. So we have witnessed increases in everything, uh, PM, heat waves, and also ozone. Yeah, and this is because of large-scale atmospheric circulation. This is just to add. Thank yeah. you. So uh, we'll go here and then there and then back. Uh, Catherine Wilson with Climate Works. I'm confused about the effect of black carbon in aerosols on the Sahel. So this is for Kenza, I guess. Um, where because it was presented in a positive light, I think you were saying that reducing black carbon is beneficial to restoring noise moisture to the Sahel. Um, but because aerosols are mixed and we're going to experience brightening, I'm thinking, how can that be true? Is it because you're only selectively taking out the black carbon from from BC rich sources like diesels, or are you taking it from biomass burning and and cook stoves and everything else? And you can still say with the co-pollutants that those combustion controls are going to help add moisture to the Sahel. Okay, this is a wonderful question, but I think the best expert in the room is Drew because he is behind this, this study. <laughs> so I think, yeah, it will give more clarification. So in the in the simulations that we ran, both reductions in bright aerosols like sulfate helped uh, to avoid the, the drying that was projected otherwise to occur under the baseline and removal of black carbon along with co-emissions. So we had an SLCP focus scenario in the Africa assessment. Both of those were very helpful. What is the most challenging, I think, is that the models don't respond all the same for rainfall. Um, in any case, even something like CO2, you know, something well mixed where there's no ambiguity in what's going on with the driver. So what we really need are, are a few more studies to really characterize the robustness. One New study also just came out this year. Unfortunately, I didn't see it till after we'd finished ours. Uh, but it does seem to support the same kind of thing that African aerosols, both for different reasons, both the absorbing and the reflecting, uh, can can avoid drying in them. So, so just a really quick follow up is that I mean that that brightening because I think about these in common English terms <laughs> that that brightening is not drying, <laughs> at least in Af in the African context. So it's, it's a very regional effect, yeah. but yes, that, that is correct. It's okay. in, and, and actually, prior research has shown that when European sulfur drifts down over Africa, the same kind of thing, that it caused drying. How uh, weird. So, yes, it's a little counterintuitive. 
Thank you. Uh, so one and then two. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Orlando Cabrera Rivera from the Commission for Environmental Cooperation. Um, a question clarification for, for Dr. Uh, Schindel. Um, when you talked about timing in matters, uh, the death attributable to short-lived climate pollutants, are those deaths just for respiratory illnesses or are you accounting also for uh, heat-related uh, death or floods or other uh, climate-related uh, health impacts? It was on the on the slide that you had forty four million death. Uh, was that for? Was that a question for Drew or for Chandra? Sorry, uh, for Drew. Yeah. Mortality. Yeah. What are you accounting right. it for? It was a slide FLCP from related mortality. Uh, Is it just um, the exposure to PM two point five and ozone, or are you 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 including heat deaths and other climate related? Yes. yes. Uh, that's that's a very good question, and it is much easier to attribute uh, particulate matter exposure to mortality because we have studies from, it's never everywhere in the world, but many, many different parts of the world. When it comes to ozone, we have a more limited but still pretty good data set. When it comes to heat, it's, you know, the human body tends to behave the same when you give it a uh, toxic pollutant, ozone or PM. Mm -hmm. uh, there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of variation around the planet, but when it comes to heat, there is very large variations around the planet. So there we have been struggling with the lack of data. You know, the, the heat wave in Paris, for example, that killed so many people mm -hmm. is a routine temperature in a place like Bangkok or, or in India, right? And so we can't use, we, we we require a much greater level of detail than we do for air pollution. So our ability to analyze mortality related to heat is relatively limited compared to either PM or ozone. The one other thing I would say is that when, I think Kenza mentioned that in Africa, you know, you get these these things happening at the same time. And that's another thing where we have limited ability to understand how people respond to multiple stressors at once. Uh, it's likely to be worse than if you have things individually one at a time, but we don't really know how to take into account. So there's a lot of room to advance on these things. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, my name is Rachel Carl and I work at Oxfam America. Um, thank you all for your presentations. This is a question for any of the panelists, um, but a few of your presentations touched on women. And so I wondered if we could dig into that a bit more, especially given that the CCAC launched a new gender strategy last year. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on um, the gendered impacts of SLCPs and how we should be thinking about gender in our work. Thank you. You should miss that one. Which one of you wants to? Yeah, thanks a lot, Rachel. Um, so this is an excellent question. And I think, um, I guess I want to stress uh, two points. Um, the first point is that uh, I think there's a, a growing uh, understanding that uh, when we look at impacts, we, we also need to take a look at impacts not just on men and women, but also um, uh, different social groups, uh, groups at different levels of uh, socioeconomic development, um, because I think uh, that um, that will give us a clear picture, um, not only just to sort of the, the overall impacts, but also um, who is getting impacted. Um, and also, I think that gets into the, the sort of next point is uh, about the the, the solution side of things, and this is something I was trying to emphasize um, in my presentation, is that I think we also need to do a better job of, of connecting with different social groups. I mean, women especially, but other groups as well, um, to, to make them part of the, the solution uh, process. And, um, and 
and in that context specifically, I think one of the the challenges, at least that that I've seen and and um and 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 looked at to some extent, is a lot of times when we look at impacts only, um, there can be a tendency to to mm, perpetuate a, a bit of a, a victim's narrative, and I I think it is important to look at the impacts, but if if we only look at the impacts and don't think about um, solutions, that victim's narrative can also be a bit disempowering. Um, and so I think it's both impacts and solutions and empowering different social groups, especially women, to, to join in those solutions. Now, how that relates to the the um, the efforts to mainstream gender into the uh, CCAC's proposal process, um, I have to say that's a little bit outside of my scope. Um, but, uh, I think it, it might be useful to consider, you know, having perhaps a gender expert, um, work with the SAP to talk about some of those issues a little bit more, um, and to bring it, you know, for instance, into our assessment reports a little bit more actively. Um, so if, at least from my perspective, those are things that I can see us doing, but it would be good to have a, you know, perhaps next time we have one of these science policy dialogues to have a session on gender, um, and, inclusion and, and equity issues to really dive deeper into some of those those questions. Thank, thanks for that. Thank you, Eric. Um, okay, uh, now to Sean. Thanks, Nathan. Um, Sean McGuire from the Clean Air Fund. And uh, so I'm not a scientist, so I'll ask a very basic question. Um, on the on the um, description of today's session, uh, it mentioned BC forcing change from Air 5 to Air 6. So I'm wondering if you can walk us, maybe Drew, you could walk us through what the change was and what is the argument now for working on BC as, as, a, as, a, as a climate issue? Because um, I understand that that shift of Air 5 to Air 6, in some people's eyes, has, has undermined um, the argument from looking at it uh, from a climate perspective. Right. Thank you, Sean. It's a good question. I think somebody mentioned, you now I've forgotten which of my colleagues here just mentioned, you know, global. Global mean is not the only uh, only thing we're worried about. So you were right that the global average um, reported by the AR5 for the, the planet-wide effect of black carbon is lower than the best estimate for, um, sorry, for AR6 is lower than for AR5. So there's a couple things that happened and then a couple comments. One, one of the things that happened is that the direct impact of the aerosol didn't change all that much. But what did change was that more models had looked at the effects of black carbon on clouds and the clouds are always what's really complicated with these things. So the average across the available studies said that, that the cloud response would offset part of the direct. And so the net ends up being instead of a bit larger than the, the pretty well understood direct effect, a bit smaller. However, the studies that looked at clouds, they don't even agree on the sign of that response. All right, so you're averaging together a bunch of numbers which are essentially all over the place, and you come out with a best estimate that this is an offsetting cooling effect, but you don't have a lot of confidence in that. So I think that's important to keep in mind that the, the main factor of the adjustment is something that is still not very well understood and not easy to constrain from observations because clouds are very difficult to observe. The other thing that happened, though, is if you look at the AR6 reporting mm -hmm. for things like carbon monoxide, that it is it has a higher contribution than in AR5. And as we've talked about with the with the CCAC measures, we're always looking at, at the effect of all of the co-pollutants. So the black carbon rich measures, it's it's not so obvious that the net effect of those really changed as substantially. It's probably a bit lower at the global mean if you have CO go up a little and BC go down a little. The one other thing, though, is that at the same time that, you know, that we looked at this global mean in AR6, there have been all of the kind of studies that Chandra was just talking about, that Kenza was just talking about, uh, that I spoke a little bit about. Of we, we understand more and more that black carbon has a, an ability to strongly perturb the rainfall patterns and to cause local heat waves and heat extremes. So I would argue that one of the messages 
is that, you know, and this goes to many things. It's like when I showed the impacts on, on agriculture um, for methane versus CO2, right? They're not at all proportional to the impacts of methane and CO2 on temperature. Agriculture responds much more strongly to methane than CO2 because of everything else going on. So the impacts of black carbon measures versus, you know, N2O, CO2, HFCs, right? It might be relatively small for global mean temperature, but it might be much more important for millions of people that depend on the monsoon, for example, or that are suffering from heat waves. And I think we're beginning to understand much better that the, the regional effects are not necessarily strongly correlated with the global mean temperature effects, which is what the AR6 was looking at. Thank you, Drew. Any more questions? Back to Zig. Yeah. Thank you for giving me again the floor. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, a brief after question from what uh, what Catherine was asking about and the assumptions in the modeling that you have done for Africa for the rest of the world. So when you mitigated black carbon or aerosols in Africa in your scenarios, what kind of assumptions were made for that scenario for the rest of the world? And Drew, you mentioned to yourself that you know in the past, European change in aerosols have affected drying in Sahel. So how the changes globally would affect further changes in Africa? I mean, that's something Africa cannot, will not be acting in isolation in all of that, like none of the continents. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I I agree that um, when we talk about what what is done in Africa, definitely it will impact the whole world. But again, according to the model to the modeling results that we do have, and what what we found outside is that there will be the drying outside. And I think, and again, Drew, correct me if I'm wrong. It is only in Africa that we found that there is an an uh, capacity to to impact the climate. But again, because we have the large scale circulation, we need to do more studies to know how this large scale circulation can impact outside. And I mentioned that the flow uh, that is coming from Africa, from the from the Sahara, the North African Sahara, Sahara is impacting also uh, Europe. So definitely um, we need more research to know how this, according to the general circulation, there will be these interactions between uh, the climate in Africa and the climate outside. Uh, thank you so much. I'm Joe Swale from Malawi. My question is going to Kenza. Your, your graphs were aggregating regions like Africa, Asia, and the like. I've noted, uh, like since two days ago, when presenters were presenting their reports, most of the emissions were progressively, you know, increasing. And yet we had huge impact on COVID in 2020, 2021. That was not reflected in the emissions. Uh, what can you uh, conclude out of that? And yet you are aggregating, you know, like Africa and eventually the entire globe. Is that the true reflection on the emissions on ground or they are just estimate or what can you say about modeling now? Yeah. You. Can you again say what is exactly in 2021? I didn't get this. COVID. COVID. <clears throat> okay. The so, impact of COVID on emissions. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, you would assume that there was a positive impact because there was less human activity, but that's not reflected in the data. Yeah. You find that data is progressing, increasing, you know, more emissions by the year, as if human activity has been increasing over the year. And yet we'd expect less in 2020, 2021. So what can you say about modeling now? Yeah. And what can you say about the, the correctness of data? Is that data really a true reflection on what's happening on ground? Or they're just models that we computed long time ago and they're just uh, producing universal data, which is not a true reflection. Thank yeah, you. yeah, and thank you for the question because I have worked on the impact of COVID, and in fact, it's not the impact of COVID, but the impact of the strategy that was with COVID, which is which is the lockdown, and definitely we were able to see that uh, this strategy impacted uh, air quality, and and we have seen improvements in air quality, and 
I remember that uh, the the team uh, where I with with whom I was working were waiting. What kind of impacts would be on greenhouse gases? And then we were thinking, and we said, okay, we need to wait five hundred years so that we can know what will happen for 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 the greenhouse gases. So again, and and then um, yes, we had um, a kind of in instantaneous uh, impact because we had a strategy and from an air quality perspective, we say, okay, now model modelers have a new scenario to work with, which is the COVID scenario or the lockdown scenario, which means we have less emissions. Uh, but then uh, how this is impacting uh, climate models, I think that we need to wait to see how this uh, 2021 strategy will impact uh, uh, greenhouse models. Uh, with with air quality, again, I want to say that it was uh, instantaneous and then we returned back to our activities and then the models uh, took again what, what is going on and then it was a small scenario 2021. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, I would say that Modelers are having now this scenario and we are waiting for the uh, answers based on the scenario. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, so we are now at time. Uh, I want to thank everyone for participating actively. Uh, I'd like to close by again thanking our, our distinguished panel of scientific uh, advisory panel members. Please join me in a round of applause. Uh, We have a packed and, and really quite exciting agenda for the rest of the day. I hope you guys stay engaged in uh, in the three uh, or four parallel uh, breakout sessions that we will have over the course of the rest of the day. I wish I could split myself into uh, into four so I could attend them all myself. But um, yes, uh, please enjoy the coffee, uh, stay hydrated, and uh, yeah, join us for the upcoming panels. <clears throat>
Good morning. Um, if you could take your seats, we'll get started very soon. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd first like to invite Ms. Christina Zucker from the United Nations Environment Program to start us off with some opening remarks. Christina. Thank you very much. Um, so good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Cristina Zucca. I head the Pollution and Health Unit in UNEP. And from there, we coordinate air quality work of UNEP. So on behalf of UNEP, I would like to welcome you to this uh, science policy dialogue on assessing the costs of inaction for air pollution. We have heard that we made uh, good progress on air pollution, but much more needs to be done. In fact, maybe not very good progress, but some progress. In the ASEAN region alone, around half a million people died in 2019 for exposure to PM 2.5 air pollution, indoor and outdoor. And while everybody is affected, the most vulnerable people, they bear the brunt of the impact. Um, out of these premature deaths, 14,000 were infants in the first month of their life. 
As we all know, for action, uh, we need to make the case. Um, countries are busy with many uh, competing priorities and budgetary pressures. But if we make a strong case for investment uh, in air pollution action, then um, action can happen. Um, today, we are going, in fact, to hear about assessments that uh, are meant exactly to do this. They look at uh, how doing nothing on air pollution is actually expensive. Of course, mitigation measures have a price tag, uh, but not acting is much more expensive. Developing robust evidence that demonstrates this is the key um, to help governments make a strong investment case for cost-effective, targeted, and ambitious mitigation measures. The benefit the environment, health, and the economy, and the climate. And uh, so if we unlock this evidence, we can also help bridge the financing gap that is holding back uh, more um, decisive action on air pollution. I'm pleased that UNEP has been able to support uh, the assessment work in Southeast Asia that we're going to hear about today. Uh, the findings of this work can be used to catalyze action, to inform the development of better policies and legislation. We also know and we need to remember that action on air pollution must be consultative and inclusive. We must include those very people who are most affected by air pollution and who are usually unlikely to contribute to the design of solutions. The co-benefits must be beneficial for all. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to thank partners and individuals that have been involved in this work. Uh, I would like to thank the ASEAN Secretariat, who worked with us in UNEP to develop and endorse the initial concept for this project. And of course, everyone who is here attending the event today. In UNEP, we stand ready to continue working with countries in this space. So I look forward to hearing views and uh, feedback and ideas. And uh, now I would like to call uh, my colleague Mushtaq Meno, also from UNEP. Thank you, Christina. And I'm Mushtaq Meno, Regional Coordinator for uh, Chemicals and Pollution Action for Asia Pacific in UNEP. So let me quickly go to the uh, slide to showcase what this project is all about. So this is uh, when we were looking on the cost of inaction for the air pollution to raise the awareness, to raise the ambition, to raise the political will, stakeholder engagement and so on, because as you might have seen that uh, the plastic pollution treaty, which is being negotiated, came out of a lot of uh, visibilities, visuals and so on, to now making air pollution also that visual. I think this is, was one of the best ways to make it really a cost of inaction that what we are losing about. So basically this uh, project is uh, coming with all the work has been done by United Nations Environment and also other many UN agencies, World Bank, ADB, and the partners uh, like ASA, IJS, SEI, and so on, you name it. So this is a, like a trying to pull the things, strings together to make this happen. And that's why like you can see that in the project partners uh, for the immediate partners, and then we have a, like a second layer, third layer, that we have a quite many, but we had a scientific advisory uh, group and a big thanks to all of them who are sitting here in front of you that they, they guided us so intensively because this is not only about the methodology only, but also putting the methodology to work with the consultation workshops. We are government. We are thankful to Cambodia, Thailand, Indonesia, and now lately Laos to come together, to work together, to make this project happen. And this was uh, quite a uh, short, uh, I would say, time span. And so it was a lot of a pressure on the partners like uh, Zig. He will come after me to tell how he managed the things and uh, try to make it happen. And that uh, really, on the one hand, we are trying to make this point that we are have a data, like, you know, assessments. How we do that? Because uh, as we all know, data assessment is the most complicated one. But then how you translate science into the action or in the policy. For doing that, you have to come with the knowledge products, capacity building, and so on, the awareness raising. And then also you have to make it 
multi-stakeholder. It has to be owned by the governments. So that's why we brought the ASEAN Secretariat in place. We brought the government so it can be owned by them. So with this methodology in place and examples in place and the best practices, tools and guidance in place, we are really looking forward that this can be harmonized with a lot of work happening all over the world by different agencies and so on. And then we hope that uh, the countries can come together similar way like plastic pollution on the air pollution because this is the most immediate issue as this came up from the cost of inaction. So at that note, I really want to thank everyone and let me now invite Zig to showcase what we have done. Over to you, Zig. Thank you very much. Uh, can we move to my slides? Oh, I should just move it myself. Yeah, move it myself. <laughs> yeah, too much <clears throat> authority I have here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really glad to see so many participants here. And I would like to start with thanking uh, UNEP for supporting and setting up this study and uh, our partners in different countries who have been equally like our team are working under pressure to deliver that and get engaged in communication that is not quite over we are trying to make the next step and bring these results to the countries jointly with experts in the countries and with support of the ministry so this is quite important i will try to give a very brief background on the project from our perspective what has been done and uh, then hand over to uh, to our colleagues in different countries to show how some of that is actually embedded or is going to embed it hopefully in the discussion on developing strategies addressing air pollution and climate change. Now, a little bit of a repetition, the first two slides about the situation, just focusing on ASEAN and uh, region and put it in perspective. What you see on this chart is current situation referring to somewhere between 2015, 2020, about more than 85% of population, I'm trying to use now a pointer here, is actually exposed to levels above WHO guidelines in the region. So only 15, less than 15% under five micrograms. Now, the yellow area in between is somewhere where national standards are sitting. So somewhere between 20 and uh, more than 50% of population is exposed to levels above national air quality standards for PM 2.5. Now, if we look into the future and consider currently existing policies that are already committed in these countries, we don't see any improvement. As a matter of fact, in terms of population exposed to levels above WHO guidelines, it's about the same. What is even worse in here, you see a lot more red color that is well above the tier one guideline, uh, interim guideline from WHO, 35 micrograms, that actually is above any of the national standards. Again, about 20 to 60 percent of population in 2030 in this baseline projection, including existing policies, would be exposed to levels above their national standards and 85 percent above um, the WHO standard. That means, of course, that it will have uh, implications in terms of health human health, but not only. I'm repeating now the statement that we heard at the beginning of this from Christina, that the half a million of people die prematurely from air pollution in 2019, according to that study, with about half uh, from ambient pollution and about half from household pollution. Of course, that's not the only impact. There's a lot of other impacts associated with uh, air pollution. And they would include, of course, a number of mobility uh, endpoints that have been already mentioned also during this meeting, crop yield loss, so linked to ozone, elevated ozone concentrations, loss of productivity in general, loss of, uh, of, uh, uh, for the economies and their competitiveness, as well as driving climate change through the SLCPs. We are building, this study is building on a lot of work you've heard about during this week. Uh, including today morning, as a matter of fact. I don't go through the whole history of CCEC and UNEP supporting assessments going back to black carbon and ozone in 2011. But for Asia, in 2019, the Asian assessment paved the way with 25 measures for Asia, 
and discriminate, dis distinguishing, highlighting also the fact that they might differ across regions within Asia, giving, actually paving a way to the study that you heard a presentation on the first day from, I just from Eric Sussman about the clean air and climate solutions for ASEAN. Building on this study, we have been producing in this project a number of assessments, the three assessments so far for the countries of cost of inaction, as well as a guide for how to do it, how to develop cost of inaction, but it includes a lot more. I will come back to that in a second. And there's policy briefs also, one of them on gender related issues and the other one summarizing it all. We've heard to not only today, but throughout the whole week, I have honestly have not heard anybody saying that we don't know what to do. I think we all kept saying we really know what to do, but there's a problem that we don't act fast enough. So we face increasing air pollution in many places or don't achieve what we promised to ourselves in terms of further reduction. Within this study, we focused on 12 solutions addressing air quality, especially from perspective of PM 2.5 pollution. You will see this kind of slide on each presentation, as a matter of fact. That's a summary for the ASEAN region. And I'm repeating here these arrows pointing out to what introduction of these measures in this case, the third bar added to the previous one before, showing that we are moving on that scale towards more than a third of the population enjoying clean air defined as uh, by the air quality guideline of WHO from 2021 of five micrograms to PM 2.5. Now that means still a lot of people would be facing pollution that is well above that. However, you see this arrow pointing here, a factor of 2.5 moves about 100 million people from moves from 200 million people now or in 2030 to about 250 people enjoying clean air in a scenario with implementation of this measure. And actually, we eradicate these high concentrations in such a scenario. So we've looked into that from the perspective of what actually is the foregone opportunity if we don't do it, if we do nothing about it and continue happy about our current policies implemented, what will be actually the consequence of that in terms of health and the price that is paid for health from that pollution? I think nobody at uh, this meeting was brave enough to say what cost of inaction is. It's interesting because this term has been you know, in corridors and during the meeting, and I think nobody was brave enough to define it. So let me expose myself and put one definition. There's many of them in the literature, so there is one, how we went about that. And it's a fractional look at it only. So what we did in the study, we develop a pollution strategy into the future, or pollution pathway to the future. So we're looking into emissions and pollution exposure concentration in a baseline and in a policy scenario going beyond current policy. Baseline includes policies. The policies have cost. So we see here that the orange bar is increasing between the baseline and the additional policy. Obviously, we are adding here mitigation. There is a price associated with it. And there is health impacts associated with it. Of course, there's also other impacts. They're not plotted here. But in terms of health, forget the scale here. This is all conceptual, of course. But the change is right. So we are reducing health impacts just like we reduce pollution with increasing costs. So what is it really that we are comparing here? We can talk about cost of action. That's the difference between the orange bars. And we can talk about cost of inaction, which is the difference between the impacts costed here. That's the blue bars. So this is what we defined in this study as cost of inaction. As I say, it considers only a partial fractional picture in terms of which impacts are included. I will come back to limitations in a minute. Uh, just one slide. I don't have any complicated things about the methodology. I'm not going to talk about details of the model that has been used. That's the GAINS model that has been used in the assessment that produces, actually it's an integrated assessment model that includes primary and secondary pollution formation and it 
uh, calculates exposure in the future for different scenarios that are craved by us and jointly defined by us and allows then for estimation of impact. And it does consider um, urban scale also in a sense of distinguishing different exposure within urban environments and rural environments. And uh, we are developing the, the scenarios, as I said earlier, based on the study from the Asian assessment work. I would like to spend a word about um, limitations. So we have to be honest with ourselves, of course, with this study that has been constrained. What can we do within the time given? And we have made very clear, plotted very clear boundaries between what can be achieved and what is included in the study. And certain things are, of course, challenges. We know, like everywhere, we have issues with data and model validation. And this is what we struggled as well. But we have worked jointly with the teams, uh, receiving a lot of help and information on measurements of air pollution in the countries, on data about hospital admissions that went into this study uh, wherever they were available. And I think there's more that can be done, but that is a great start for that. The second bullet here is pointing to the fact that the landscape is changing very fast, partly because of activities like this one and the CCEC support, as well as a lot of great work nationally, or maybe the other way around, the national work is should be put first because there's a lot of work being done. We try to capture that building the scenario, which is a baseline, as well as envisage what is happening in the future. But that is a changing landscape asking basically for continuation of that work if we want to stay on top of it and provide information that is useful. Because only when we capture latest developments, we can directly engage with the policy community and not only policy community, private sector as well, uh, that is actually then acting on, on that. And uh, I think I mentioned already that it's limited. So there's a number of impacts and effects that are not included. We focused on health. We did not look into, for example, crop impacts in here in this study. We did not look into some of the um, uh, endpoints that could be taken into account, but there was no data or, um, or no robust assessment was possible at the time. And of course, there's also this cost of action. We're not going to talk about cost of action, but it is part of the equation and will come during the discussions for sure. We have here in the model focusing on cost of air pollution technology rather than considering the whole transformational costs when we talk about say, uh, a climate scenario and moving towards 1.5 degree, there's a big transformation in many sectors needed. These costs were not considered. I said I will not show any results, but I allowed myself to steal one from one of the countries that will follow. This is an example picked up from Indonesia, just to highlight that within the focus on air pollution, of course, we look into co-benefits and also these measures are affecting uh, air pollution and climate. And this is an example how, on one hand, you see PM 2.5 reduction, it's funny direction maybe, but this is a reduction. The dots are single measures. So you have reduction of PM 2.5 within 2030 and 2050 perspective. And that's moving on this scale on the X axis. And then what does it mean for the CO2 equivalent here? Because it's a sum of CO2 and methane. Four different measures. I highlight two transformation related to renewable energy in power production and industry. And the other one is electrification of uh, vehicles, as well as improvement of emission standards. You see them moving on the scale of over time of pollution, but at the same time, elevating reduction of CO2. And the scale, also time scale matters. So this is one example of how uh, these policies focusing in the first place on air quality have this co-benefit component and deliver also on the on the climate. Now, finishing just a, a slide or two slides actually on something that has been developed in parallel, which is a guideline how to produce cost of inaction. This kind of guideline uh, will allow actually, we believe, to mobilize resources to work to systematically establish and support institutions, supporting uh, collaboration with many stakeholders, uh, building actually uh, confidence that we can do it, that there's a technical capacity or maybe a need to develop technical capacity to actually deliver this kind of um, 
assessment and, and motivate the use of this kind of assessment. The, the guideline, the way it's designed, it actually decides, the, it shows steps, how to move, what kind of information is necessary to develop cost of inaction. But there's a lot more than that, because when you do that, we actually have to develop very basic information about emission inventory. Where are we now? What does it mean for pollution? We will be asked to run a model and calculate concentrations or look into measurement stations, but define an emission inventory now. Look into our baseline and impacts of that baseline, various impacts. There's a lot more than health addressed in the guideline. They are much broader. So we are defining, we are learning also in cases we don't have it, to build an emission inventory over time, including different policies and assess impacts. We look into opportunities, the mitigation opportunities, scan through the database, policy discussion, stakeholder discussion involving many of them, and get into understanding what can be done and when, understanding this mitigation potential, where can we end up? And what does it mean if we don't do it? Cost of inaction, impact of inaction will be defined through that. Now, if you don't want to study everything and look into all reports, there is a policy brief that is already available that summarizes it all on four pages, giving an impression of key elements of analysis and key results, and has all of the references to all of the national studies you're going to hear about embedded also in their national policy perspective. And, um, and I will thank you very much for the, for the attention. Thank you very much, Sig. Um, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Young Sun Wu, Director General of the International Union of Air Pollution Prevention and Environmental Protection Associations and Professor of Environmental Engineering at Konkok University in Seoul, Korea. Dr. Young Sun Wu will moderate the remainder of today's session. Thank you, Tom. Um, can everybody hear me okay in the back? All right, great. Um, first of all, I think before we move on, we didn't have a chance to thank the, um, the two presenters who um, gave short remarks in the beginning. So please give a round of applause to Ms. Christina Zuka and Dr. Mushtag Menmum from UNEP. Yeah, um, I'm um, Young Sanu, like I was just introduced by Tom. Uh, I'm the Director General of IUAPA. For those of you who are not familiar with IUAPA, it's the International Union of Air Pollution Prevention and Environmental Protection Associations. Um, that's a long name. Uh, it's a gathering of um, national air pollution and act, um, what do you call it, atmospheric science societies um, around the world. Um, it used to be based in the UK for over 40 years. Um, it has moved to Korea. Um, I am fortunate to be the um, new director general right now. And the secretariat has been moved to Korea. It's sort of appropriate, you might say, that um, most of the problems in air pollution are centered in Asia. And it seems apropos that um, the secretariat of IUAPA has also moved there. Um, we are kind of slowly getting on our um, base um, after COVID. Um, we just got our homepage running again, and I have my new newly minted name cards here, a pack of 200 that I just newly ordered. So if any of you want to say hello to me, please come after the um, session. Um, from CCAC standpoint, uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with um, Richard Mills. IUAPA is a member of CCAC. I'm also on the science panel for the UNEP APCAP, the um, Asia Pacific Committee on Air Pollution. Um, so for me, having CCAC and UNEP, App, UNEP um, host their conference together was really, really fortunate for me. And I'd like to thank, um, again, for the organizers that invited me and also K. Pat Du, who um, helped me uh, organize this, I mean, had me chair this very important session. Okay, um, let me talk to you about what we're going to um, do in this session from this point on. Uh, we have 90 minutes of which about... Um, 
30 minutes have already passed. Uh, we have 15 people who are going to stand in front of the mic, including the four people who have already um, done so so far. So my point there being that we don't have that much time. So all the speakers, please keep to your allotted time um, allotment. And um, this is a science policy dialogue. So um, Zig talked about the, the science per se. We're going to have three representatives from the countries talking about the policy side. And in order to facilitate a healthy dialogue, we'll, we'll, we will have designated interventions um, after the country um, um, uh, presentations. And also, we'd like some healthy um, um, interaction with the audience. So please prepare your questions. We'll have two um, kind slots for you to ask questions to either the panelists or the speakers. So please be aware of that. Okay, so let me introduce the three or four um, speakers that we have on the um, rostrum here. From the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment, Thailand, we have Ms. Uh, Siaporn Rung Sianam, Director of the Transboundary Air Pollution Subdivision in the Pollution Control Department. Thank you for joining us. Um, from the Ministry of Environment of Cambodia, we have Mr. Chanda Him, Deputy Director of the Air Quality, Noise and Vibration Management Department. Thank you. And from Indonesia, we have two for the price of one. <laughs> um, we have Ms. Inda Hidayat, Senior Technical Officer in the Environment and Health Directorate of the Ministry of Health and Professor Puji Lestari, okay, Professor in Air Quality Management and Atmospheric Chemistry at the Bandung Institute of Technology. Okay, so um, this is a science policy dialogue and the three policymakers have been invited to respond to two basic guiding questions. And let me point that out to you. The first question is how can highlighting the relative costs and benefits of taking action and not taking action on air pollution help policymakers? <coughs> The second question we gave them was, um, what steps can governments take to support a stronger science policy interface around air pollution? And again, I would like to politely remind the um, presenters that time is very tight. You each have eight minutes for your country presentations. And I would like to start with um, Ms. Siwa Porn um, Rongsiyanong to give her presentation first. I hope I didn't torture your name too bad. <laughs> Please. Quite nice. Thank you very much. Uh, can I have my PowerPoint presentation, please? Where can I bring? Okay. So as I have very short time, so I will go very quickly. Uh, this slide show the air quality situation in Thailand. So uh, this picture show that we still have problem with PM two point five and ozone. And for the uh, current air quality management in Thailand, I show by this figure. This figure is um, a cycle of interrelated elements proposed by the US EPA. Uh, what we have done is first PCD established goals related to air quality. An example is national ambient air quality standards that will protect public health, including people who are more vulnerable to the effects of air pollution. Next, emissions reduction need to achieve the goal uh, determine using emission inventories, air quality monitoring, air quality modeling, and other assessment tools to understand the air quality problem fully. These tools are available for Bangkok and metropolitan region and northern part of Thailand that are, are the more serious uh, air pollution problem where air pollution and is a major source in Thailand. And in developing control strategies, PCD consider how pollution prevention and emission control technique can be applied to achieve the reduction needed. In this step, the regulation or incentive program that lower emission from sources need to be put in place and the rules need to be enforced the cost of implementing policy for air quality management needs to be presented and considered among the problems in the country. For the last step is to undertake ongoing evaluation to know if air quality goals are being met. Uh, 
on the right hand side you can see some example of technology and innovation that thailand used to disseminate information to the public like air quality, air quality monitoring data control emission sources uh, we uh, we develop application called burn check to control open burning in northern part of Thailand and air quality prediction using air quality modeling, WAF chem, thus uh, scientific information and research are key information and have been incorporated in air quality management in Thailand. For the challenge in our policy implementation, although emission reduction has been studied on how much emission from different sectors are needed to be reduced, policy development needs very strong information on the cost and benefits. For air quality management, all air pollution control comes at cost. For example, to reduce emission from traffic in Bangkok, replacing in use Euro 1 and Euro 2, vehicle with cleaner vehicle will get highest impacts. However, there are associated costs that the government and the owners need to pay. So uh, the study of cost of inaction is uh, very useful to Thailand and it's quite new. When I, I first hear about this, I, I was so excited and would like to do this uh, very much. Also, in terms of the government, uh, pollution is not the only problem in the country, right? Like Thailand also have another sustainable development issue like plastic waste flooding and so on. So um, strong scientific based information on the cost of not implementing strong policy in on air pollution need to be studied and used to identify the need to implement this policy. Um, one of the project PCD with UNEPRO, ISA and AIT are working on assessing the cost of inaction in policy implementation in Thailand with the main purpose to provide strong scientific proof on the impact of not implementing air pollution control early in Thailand. This information can further be used to support air quality policy in our country. For population exposure to PM2.5, Thailand has introduced effective policy which have improved air quality over the last decade, but more needs to be done. Considering current air quality legislation, the health burden from air pollution exposure is projected to increase due to economic and population growth, as well as population aging. This asset calculate that without any additional action on air pollution, there will be almost 24,000 premature deaths due to ambient air pollution exposure in Thailand per year by 2030. On another information, more than 23 million people will be exposed to annual PM2.5 concentration, more than 15 microgram per cubic meter in 2030 which is the current ambient air quality standard in Thailand. Right now, Thailand, we are already used the interim target three of the WHO guideline for PM2.5 national standard. Further action could have significant health benefits for the population of Thailand, implementing further policy, for example, as travel solutions, on the left, beyond current legislation could avoid 17,000 premature deaths, 16,000 hospital admissions, and almost 12,000 emergency room visits due to poor air quality every year by 2030. The human health related cause of not taking further action on air pollution are estimate to be equal to about 2% of Thailand GDP in 2030. Lack of immediate further action on air pollution could cost Thailand about 12.5 billion US a year in 2030. Based on a selection of mortality and morbidity impacts of air pollution, the actual cost of inaction will likely be higher 
if our other causes and foregone benefits are accounted for. On the right hand side, the total benefit of acting with strong policy for the whole region provide additional benefit to Thailand and also other countries. So uh, ASEAN need to work together. As I'm, I'm not going to have a chance to uh, to join in the uh, discussion session. So I have a very important message that uh, in our in our region, I mean ASEAN region, we still lack of the study on health benefit and cause of inaction. So I think we need to do study like this more for our region because. Uh, air pollution in our region is also transboundary. We cannot work in just single country. We need to work at the regional context. So um, I, I think I say this many times, but uh, I I want to say again that Thailand is standard to work with our region and would like to be a hub for uh, study or for knowledge or anything that we could help our neighbors. I think I could make a good Tom, right? Thank you very much. Thank you. And actually, you're right. The timing was almost perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much for your um, very interesting presentation. Um, the job of a moderator is twofold, I think. You have to keep the right time and usually summarize the uh, the presentations. Um, in lieu of the first um, responsibility, I'm going to refrain from doing much of the summaries until seeing if we have some more time. So we'll just move straight on to the next presentation. Next speaker is Mr. Um, Chandath Him. Um, would you like to start your presentation? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Yang, for having me. Uh, today, I'm pleased to present the national assessment of the cause of inaction of tackling air pollution in Cambodia. Specifically, I will focus uh, on the, uh, the cause of inaction and the benefit of uh, taking action. So uh, let me move to the next slide. So uh, this slide, as you can see, there are, there are seven main sources of air pollution in Cambodia. From left to right, we can have, we have a transport uh, sector. So particularly, uh, it is from uh, vehicle emission, like car, motorcycle. And uh, the second one is uh, constructions and agriculture, residual burnings, industry, household cooking stove, and waste burning and uh, wild Fire. Seeing I lost one reason. Okay. So among the uh, seven main sources of uh, air pollution in Cambodia, transportation is is the most air pollution contributor, uh, following by industrial and uh, residential sector. In particular, the resident soil sector is the largest source of PM2.5 and black carbon. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the transport sector is the largest source of uh, nitrogen oxide and carbon monoxide and carbon uh, dioxide. So it, uh, I just uh, want to briefly uh, brief about uh, air quality management in Cambodia. So uh, the Ministry of Environment have adopted three uh, main uh, principles, including uh, preventing, reusing, and recovery. In here, preventing uh, means to uh, prevent the pollution happening at the first place. And for reusing means if the pollution happening, we need to take necessary uh, measures to minimize the impacts on uh, public health and ecosystem. Uh, after all, the government will uh, apply action and mechanisms to uh, remedy the environmental damage from the pollution incident. So uh, taking uh, the three uh, main principles in account to ensure air quality, Ministry of Environment with their mandate are uh, installing air quality monitoring station, impose uh, pollution inspection, and developing a legislation guideline to maintain air quality. So here, uh, 
I just want to show uh, some uh, regulations uh, that uh, related to air quality and air pollution control in Cambodia. Here we have uh, the sub-degree on uh, air pollution control uh, at the from your left side. And then we have a sub-degree on uh, environmental impact assessment and sub-degree on uh, solid waste management. And uh, we have a circular measure on uh, air pollution uh, prevention and reduction. And we have uh, developed a recently a clean air plan of Cambodia. So this is the air pollution and health impacts. So uh, the report highlight that in in 2015, the entire population are exposed to uh, PM 2.5 uh, level above the current WHO air quality guidelines, uh, particularly uh, about uh, five micrograms. And over 80% are exposed uh, to uh, level about the uh, 2005 WHO guidelines. So it leads uh, to causing a premature death and high burdens of mobility uh, from cardiovascular and uh, respiratory disease. So uh, in this slide, so uh, the benefits of uh, Reusing uh, air pollution, yeah. So uh, through implementing uh, the the uh, twelve measures of air pollution uh, reductions, these are uh, from uh, Asian Clean Air and uh, Climate Solution for Asian study. So it can uh, improve the impacts from air pollution a lot. So uh, the, we have uh, two main scenarios. So uh, the business as usual scenarios. Uh, like uh, the policy, the current policy that we have. So uh, it's a projection that uh, 2030. Uh, so our population may be increased around 18 million. And uh, the population exposed uh, the air pollution over the WHO standards. However, if we uh, impose, uh, strongly impose the air pollution uh, uh, mitigation measures, the 12, uh, measures we can uh, uh, maintain uh, air quality and use the the high impact of uh, air pollution to our population, especially in uh, the the highest one is uh, like you can see uh, the the red um, color, the red bar. We don't have uh, for the uh, like uh, commitment implement the the twelve uh, uh, solution. And also uh, around 2 million people can uh, breathe uh, a good air quality that uh, comply with the WHO standard. So this is the benefit of air pollution uh, reduction. So the current scenario by 2030, the hair damage cost alone in Cambodia are estimated to reach uh, almost 1.1 billion US per year. A value equal to 3.1% uh, of Cambodia GDP. So in contrast, the strong mitigation scenarios due to the success of uh, the 12 uh, clean air solution in using PM2.5 concentration, the cost is estimated to uh, drop to approximately uh, three uh, 380 million US dollar per year. So equivalent to about 1% of GDP in 2030. So uh, this is another benefit. So uh, if, uh, in the current policy scenario, uh, this related to health impacts, uh, opportunity to increase while they implement all uh, 12 uh, solution in the ambitious storm mitigation scenario could effectively reduce the total hospital emissions by almost uh, 4,000, as well as reduce the number of emergency room visits from asthma by 1,500 and avoid a three, around 6,200 premature deaths. 
So uh, this is the further step for the government uh, of Cambodia, especially in this environments, to ensure that yeah, we know now we take action so we can benefit. If we don't, we will lose uh, not only the public health and also the economy. So uh, now the government, uh, yes, we have uh, we developed a clean air plan in uh, 2021. And through this, we implement uh, uh, the main mitigation measure uh, highlighted in the clean air plans. And now we are uh, in, uh, we are updating our sub degree. We have a sub degree on uh, air pollution control that uh, issues uh, in 2000, so around like 20 years uh, ago already. So it quite a little bit out of date. So we, we are updating now to uh, ensure that air quality standard are uh, comply with uh, the regional and also the WHO standard. And besides this, we, we are developing technical guidelines for vehicle emission control and fuel quality. So we will follow uh, Euro 4 and 2030. We will uh, we now uh, developing a roadmap for Euro 6. So uh, um, we have uh, 2030, we will uh, um, have a Euro 6 roadmap for vehicle and also uh, fuel quality. And beside this, uh, installing uh, more air quality monitoring equipment is essential to ensure that we have uh, the good data and also uh, the good uh, aspects of air pollution and to ensure the source of uh, air pollution, then we can take a, a proper measure to uh, maintain air quality. Pollution inspection also another key uh, role because we, we we want to make sure that pollution source comply with the standards. So a regular regular inspection uh, need to take place. Research and collaboration it uh, quite like in Cambodia related to air pollution and health impact. So uh, in this context, I think um, uh, the government and also Ministry of Environment will. Uh, uh, allocate uh, a lot of energy and also uh, manpower to uh, collaborate uh, with uh, UN and also international organization to improve air quality research in Cambodia. So I, I want to leave uh, the conclusion uh, in this slide. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, Chan Da Thin. Uh, we're doing okay on time, actually. <laughs> All right, the final um, presentations will be from Indonesia. Um, Ms. Inda Hidayat and Professor Puji Lestari uh, will give the Indonesian presentations. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Yang, for having me. First of all, I would like to thank you to UNEP Asia Pacific to invite Directorate of Environmental Health Ministry of Health to participate in this meet. I will deliver a short presentation uh, overview of the policies related to air pollution from the Ministry of Health. Government of Indonesia has included air quality and climate change in the National Midterm Plan 2000. 20 until 2024 as part of the National Priority Development Agenda. This five years plan consists of the following main programs as follow. Inventory of emission sources and ambient air quality, determination of ambient air quality standards, determination of the area of protection and management of ambient air quality, provision of information to the public regarding air pollution. Termination of sources of air pollution, use of clean energy fuels, development of the best low emission technology, and initiation of the imposition of motor vehicle tax rates in compliance with emission quality standards. The Ministry of Health issues decree on housing health standards and air safety guidelines in households. Implementing these policies is challenging as operational strategies to guide intervention on the ground level are yet to be made available. A series of expert consultation meeting was conducted to identify priority issues in indoor air pollution. It was found that the focus of Ministry of National Development Planning and the Ministry of Environment and Forestry is on ambient air pollution 
as the uh, uh, our policy. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Manpower is monitoring indoor air quality at workplaces. The 10 diseases with the most case in Indonesia, four of which are respiratory diseases, including lung cancer, pneumonia, asthma, and tuberculosis, not only have an impact on public health, respiratory disease also put pressure on the health insurance budget to cover the cost of treating disease caused by air pollution. So that the steps taken by the Ministry of Health are pre preventive promotive efforts to prevent people from experiencing the effects of air pollution. There are some efforts that had been made, had been and being made by the Ministry of Health to reduce air pollution. First, performance indicators for the Directorate of Environmental Health are reducing communicable disease, non-communicable disease, and increasing quality and environment health. One of the programs that we carry out to achieve this performance is the Healthy City Approach. And one of the activity strategies is through advocacy to local and cross-sectoral governments for handling indoor air quality. Second, we had updated the National Environment and Health Action Plans adjusted to the National Midterm Development Plan 2020 until 2024. This document contains action plans and targets of all issues on environment and health, water sanitation and hygiene, domestic waste and garbage, hazardous substances, disease carried by factors, air quality, environment, health in disaster, climate change, food safety, and health impact assessment. A third, we are now in process to finalize roadmap indoor air quality 2022 until 2030. This document contains action plans and targets specifically for indoor air management in terms of regulatory development, monitoring, development of support systems, capacity building, community empowerment, and institutional strengthening, as well as research and development of indoor air management. And we also want to convey, uh, we are currently Indonesia currently as a chair for Asia Pacific Regional Forum for Health and Environment for 2020 until 2024. This is voluntary forum established in 2004. Indonesia are the fifth chair after Thailand, South Korea, Malaysia, and Philippines. This is a forum to provide a platform and cooperation between the health and environment sectors at the regional and country level in the Asia Pacific region to deal with environmental health issues handled by seven thematic working groups, including air quality and health working group. Due to COVID-19, the activity plan for 2020 until mid-year 2022 were postponed. Last year, we had a joint secretariat meeting with the UN EP Asia Pacific WHO Southeast Asia and WHO Pacific region to reactivate this forum through the initiation of the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Environment from all the member states. And currently, we are collaborating with researchers and scientists from Bandung Institute Technology to help us in terms of handling air pollution. Therefore, my presentation will be continued by my colleague, Professor Pujil Stari. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Indah. Now I'm going to uh, share our key finding on uh, on the uh, assessment results from uh, cost of inactions. Now I'm start with the overview of state of the air pollution. We can see that from this graph, actually a uh, trend showing the trend in uh, emission of CO2 and air pollution in the current policies and regulation for Indonesia. And we also can see that from this graph that current policy in Indonesia are having some effect on slowing uh, the growth of the emission 
of PM 2.5 and also other pollutants such as SO2 and NOx. And this suggests the gradual decoupling of economic growth from air pollutant emission. And uh, we can also see that CO2 is actually is not decreasing so that uh, we also uh, identify that the existing policy are not currently sufficient to in uh, to offset the increase of the fuel use and production activities that's why it's resulting in co2 emission and therefore strong mitigation are needed to overcome this and we focus on the 12 solutions that has been mentioned for other uh, country as well and this uh, figure showing that the population exposed to PM 2.5 in 2030 under different scenarios. In 2030, with the current policies, actually uh, about 110 million a population will be exposed to PM 2.5 in the, under the uh, national ambient air quality air quality standard, which is 15 microgram per cubic meter. But if all measures are taken and implemented in 2030, then it's the population are double, doubles uh, from 100 into 220 a million people will enjoy the uh, concentration less than 15 microgram per cubic meter. And the current policy and strong mitigation scenario also showing in this figure that we just tried to show that there is a large potential opportunity for further improvement in yellow color, as we can see. And actually, there's some key sectors that's already implemented in Indonesia. Uh, for example, in the emission standard, electrification, transport, it also have large potential for further improvement. And uh, currently, actually, has already um, reduced the, the uh, population export exposure to PM 2.5, like uh, eight or seven, but then we can be further uh, action can be done to have a more uh, air, better air quality. And then also for the renewable energy and post combustion uh, control, it also have a large potential for improvement on air quality. Clean cooking, actually we still have some, and Indonesian government actually has converted the kerosene into 2007 and start 2007, but you know, it's usually in the rural area, it's not really well well implemented uh, 100%, but in the, in the urban area, usually quite quite good. And this also, we would like to show the cost of inaction for Indonesia. Uh, we all know that the impact of air pollution also imposes costs to society, resulting in economic losses. The economic losses can be caused by the uh, the health care system and also the uh, the loss of the work because of death and illness. And in 2030, current policies can be uh, monetized with the cost of health burden for PM 2.5. It's about uh, from mortality and morbidity is about 43 uh, billion US dollar. But if the all strong mitigation uh, implemented in, in the same years, and then the cost of health burden will reduce to 16 uh, billion US dollar. And the, the gap here is uh, cost of inaction. That's for mortality and morbidity, which is 27 billion US dollar, which is uh, equal uh, to 1.5% uh, of GDP. And this is also has been shown by uh, Zeke, actually. This is the co-benefit. So if the strong uh, mitigation are uh, uh, implemented, fully implemented, they have, they will have uh, multiple co-benefits. It's not only the reduction of the uh, greenhouse gas uh, emission, but it's also a reduction of the PM 2.5 concentration. It's quite good for transport and for renewable energy. However, then uh, we also can see that this key sector is very important for the energy sector. And of course, that with the PM 2.5 reducing, this also have a reduced in health impact as well.
So this one is our final remarks that uh, actually this project can link to the uh, Asian Pacific uh, Regional Forum on Health and Environment. So the project of the strengthening Asian member state policies with environmental health data and cost of inaction and co-benefit support Ministry of Health to provide science-based evidence related to non-communicable uh, disease and CDs and its future outlook for policy formulation in Indonesia. Enable national leaders to apply knowledge on integrated environment and health policy approach to set national priorities and recognize air pollution as cause of NCDs, which is well aligned with one of these active thematic group of this forum on air quality and health. The new data and knowledge on co-benefit and cause of inaction to strengthen recognition of air pollution as cause of NCDs in Indonesia and therefore more cost-effective measure can be planned to support the government. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we heard um, presentations from three countries, Thailand, Cambodia, and Indonesia. Um, we're going to have a changing of panelists on the rostrum here. So, um, but the country representatives will, most of them will be around for your questions uh, later on. So please give them a round of applause as they exit the rostrum. And I would like to invite um, the next set of panelists, Ms. Napak Tespreisis and Professor Kim Ohn. Kim? Ah, okay. And while we're having a changing of the um, panel members up on the rostrum and their nameplate, um, let me just give a short summary of the country reps and what they were talking about. Obviously, being the policymakers and coming from the government, um, they did some talk about the technical innovation, uh, tech, um, technology and the innovation that is needed, air quality control. Obviously, those are going to entail costs, but it was interesting to see that um, the costs of inaction has been already specifically spelled out with respect to their GDPs. Um, all had the reference to the year 2030. Um, Thailand, 2% of GDP. Uh, Cambodia, almost 3.1%, and over 1.5% for Indonesia. And as you all are very aware, as the um, the health standards are strengthened, these percentages will move up also. So it will be very interesting see, to see um, the report uh, and the policy brief that Zig is, um, and his colleagues have prepared. Okay, so let me introduce the new panelists here. Uh, Zig's going to stay on here, actually. So uh, the new panelists are Ms. Napak Tespresis. Um, she's the project um, project management specialist at the U.S. Aid Regional Development Mission for Asia. Welcome. And Professor Kim Ohn is Emeritus Professor at the Asian Institute of Technology. Welcome to both of you. Um, to this session, in this session, we have some designated um questions that we gave the panelists ahead of time. So the first question I will direct to Napak. Um, okay, so let's see. As Christina mentioned in her opening remark, we know that there is a funding gap that holds back most uh, more ambitious action on air pollution. So how can highlighting the cost of inaction um, help leverage donor investment and increase additional private sector investments in clean air measures? Napak. Thank you, Dr. Jung. Um, before we can highlight the cause of inactions, we need clear data on the extent of the problem. So I'm sure that my colleague from the WHO will have more to say about this, but they estimate that the over 99% of the world population breathes unhealthy air, causing the estimate 6 million dead per year. In addition, for the World Bank, estimate more than 8 trillion US dollar per year for the health damage alone caused by poor air quality. So for both USAID as a donor, as well as our private sector partner, um, the linkage between climate and air quality is often one of the biggest factor in how we motivate actions. 
So, for example, we know that the main emission sources for the toxic air pollutants are from combustions, transportations, agriculture, and forest fires. So there are many of the same leading emission sources that are responsible for climate change. So reducing, uh, reducing of the air pollution can mitigate the climate change. So actions on the air quality reductions also has an important um, adaptations benefits and co benefit. So, for example, in increasing the strong societal response to reduce the emissions um, by encouraging the smart growth development or choosing the cleaner commute or many more that already mentioned at earlier sessions, uh, including the avoiding seasonal opening burnings. So at the same time, these actions offer the health benefit and improve the management of environmental determinants of human environment interactions. So by framing, uh, actually, um, if you have heard from the a lot of evidence of the cause of inactions from our guest speaker by country, so framing the inactions on the air pollution within the context of the missed opportunity to fight the climate change, we can potentially spur further actions to leverage additional investment. However, unfortunately, there have been few coordinate um, global investment on the air pollution reductions relatively to the major environmental and global health issue. So better um, estimate of the core benefits will inform the selections of the most impactful actions and also driving the funding to take these actions to scale. So this is also one of the goal of our USAID collaboration with the NASA that we also developed the program called SEVERE. Uh, in 2019, we worked together with um, Thailand Pollution Control Department to develop the air quality expeller platform, as well as the burn check applications that you know can help the country and the community to visualize the connections between the local agriculture practice and also air quality. So going forward uh, for USAID, we are plan to engage in multiple way of the app qualities. And here in Bangkok, um, we have a new Soviet Southeast Asia program, which is looking forward to expanding the partnership with ASEAN because we have the mutual benefit to address on the trans transboundary issue. So, and as the agency priority is, uh, we want to engage more of the private sector engagement just to ensure that our effort is sustainability in the long run. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very insightful response. Um, next question I'd like to ask Professor um, Kim Ohn. Um, as we have seen in the country presentations, the science policy interface is crucial to tackling air pollution. What steps can the science community, funders, and other stakeholders take to support a stronger science policy interface so that good data is translated into cost-effective and impactful clean air measures? Professor Ohn. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, the theme of this section on a very attractive, eye sketching cost of in action because this is only new or innovative scientific idea to convey the information to policymakers and to public. So um, as we see that it everybody getting more excited I mean, from presenters like country presenters so also mentioned about that they are excited to see that and this is actually also scientific contribution for the for the say to solve the problem and the role of the scientific community at we vision is to produce the data data with good quality or data meeting quality objectives or either by monitoring, by mission inventory or by modeling efforts. So that the data should meet data quality objective. It means it is useful for the purpose of developing a clean air action plan. So it's through the assessment of current status of pollution and from projection for future 
pollution. And then we only talk about the cost, cost and benefit analysis, because this, how much we spend and how much we save is very important. And to me, so to, for this assessment, uh, especially the cost of inaction, because earlier we normally quantify the cost of benefit and not to compare uh, when we do nothing and we do something, what is, what is different? And especially in this section and this project, that is highlighted. So that is very good and I see that only scientific um, contribution. And um, we are very glad to see that the presenters of previous section, actually policy makers. So for scientists, uh, we, we've been working here for many many years in the same topic but then it it's fine i find that it's it's challenging for us to convey the message to policy makers to involve policy makers in the same platform to exchange information because policy makers are very very busy and that's why the catching eye topics and then the Accuracy or accurate information is very important. And I see here in this actually need further research. Like we talk about the cost of effects. So here we need to quantify the cost of value or valuation in money of life loss or the good year of our life loss. So that is very much regional specific. So we cannot use that from, like, it's very different from U.S., say, Latin America, Africa, Asia, etc., or South Asia. So that is very country-specific information. So we need more survey. We need more work in order to find it more accurate data. Besides, that cost is not, like, uh, static. It's actually dynamic. It changes with time. So that we need more research. So for scientific community, so we actually look for what? To the funding agency to fund us for the those that co-research and to provide funding for capacity building, like training, capacity building for policymakers and for various other activity, and also to fund for launching some demonstration projects because this is a lot of theory we, we heard, but then to show it by a showcase project to see the effectiveness is very important. And once we are actually the science-based information is provided and from that we have recommendation. So we hope that also to help all the stakeholders, policy makers, scientific community, funding agency, and the public to join hands to make it happen. So thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. Um, it might be a little different context, but I'm always intrigued when I hear the word um, excitement or exciting from a scientist. I know it's not the same as what our kids might feel from a BTS concert excitement kind of a thing. I had to put it, plug that BTS being from Korea, then, you know, but um, it is, there's a lot of exciting things that are going on here. And um, as scientists and policymakers, I mean, having that dialogue here, I think is a very good first step. Um, we have one final designated question to Zig. Um, Zig, we know that air pollution has no respect for boundaries or sectors, the one atmosphere concept. From your experience of working on the project, what does looking at the cost of inaction for air pollution tell us about the importance of cross-sectoral, um, for example, health environment and um, transboundary cooperation around air pollution? Zig. Thank you very much. I will start with the second question and try to stay within two minutes. Um, <laughs> now, the transboundary aspect. I think there's robust evidence. We don't have to talk too much about that. We've heard it actually during this meeting many times that transboundary is important. And we've quantified in this study uh, how for each of the measures, each of the interventions or solutions, 
what does it mean? How important that is? And I think it's important to understand and see that we should not be afraid of looking at that transboundary component. I've heard many times an argument that this is actually starting a blame game. And also it might start it, uh, an, a policy to delay some of the local action. And I think that uh, existence and awareness of this uh, transboundary component should actually um, motivate us to do more. So we should turn this weakness into a weapon to actually achieve more. In a way, it's a similar connotation, something similar to what uh, Kimon just said, that um, talking about costs brings always this argument of, oh, this is expensive. It's prohibitive maybe to even do something. Turning the argument a little bit and looking into um, cost of inaction, actually visualizing the cost of not doing anything is maybe a better way of approaching that. And then you say, that's what you win. And there's a cost associated with it rather than slashing immediately. I mean, putting in front the big costs associated with mitigation. So with the transboundary effect that is there is something similar. And I think we need to really turn that argument. I see this as an opportunity. Um, the recognition of this transboundary effect and cost should allow us to create actually alliances to work much more efficiently. And also within the region, yesterday at one of the meetings I heard, it's so nice to work with countries within the region rather than rely entirely on consultants and developed countries' experience. So here it is an opportunity that actually comes from the fact that we see that our neighbors are affecting us, that the same measure implemented in two, three, four countries can double the benefit in all of them. We just can't run away from that. We are sitting in this boat. But at the same time, I repeat, we should not use it as an excuse to delay our own responsibility to act. And one last comment about the transboundary component is a lot of experience in Europe. So the convention, it was mentioned at one of the uh, meetings yesterday, the European or European uh, Convention on Air uh, Pollution has a long tradition also on looking into that. What we've learned there is that science has been very important to understand transboundary component because we, again, can't run away from that, especially that Europe is a small place. Science has, lighted, has highlighted uncertainties, but at the same time, it highlighted robustness of many solutions. So the fact that we don't understand to the very end and to the last digit a contribution from another country or benefit from other country doing something for us, again, that's not what we should highlight. Science offers us robust solutions, even though uncertain they actually show us the way, the direction that is robust, provides us portfo with portfolios of solutions. And one word on the second part of the question, which was about the sectoral aspect, and both between the sectors as well between the domains when we talk about health and environment, for example. Two comments. Um, the implementation of many of these measures and I'm linking now to the presentation that Eric gave today in the morning in the first session, out of the box presentation, that um, a barriers, I really liked uh, a lot of comments he made, a lot of barriers associated with measures are the same across many measures, although they address different sectors, they address different communities, they address different countries. Again, a plea to work together, improving efficiency of that. You know it all. I mean, we talked about it, we keep talking about it, but th that's, that's true. This is really something that can be and should be harvested. I think we are not harvesting enough of what we already know. And this is what we see with this kind of assessments, that actually this is put into numbers that you can use and carry forward and bring that to the tables of those who make decisions. And the second comment is about the fact quite obvious, has been shown in a couple of charts today in the presentations from the study that each of these measures has benefits on the health side, on the climate side, on the environment side, and there's a lot of soci socioeconomic dimensions and gender dimensions associated with these measures. And again, 
this is something that uh, it, it's these benefits should allow us actually to actionize these measures more efficiently. It should allow us to invite stakeholders who care and who can do something. If we have that message, that multi-benefit, multi-dimensional uh, effects associated with these measures, and we have tools to quantify that with some uncertainty, but they are robust quantifications. We should be able to invite concerned stakeholders and a broad range of stakeholders to the table and benefit from that cross-sectoral and cross-domain understanding of what the mitigation can bring. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zig. Um, a comment about what you mentioned um, regarding the um, transboundary aspect. Um, Zig and I were both at the South Chabadan conference in uh, March, I guess it was. And there was a comment um, amongst the attendees about using a different term. Um, transboundary being always um, sort of signifying a transport between countries. It doesn't really have to be that way, but the connotation was like that. So they were thinking about using words like transregional and other words. Um, it's not really that. Uh, we're not being honest, I think, you know, like you said, um, in Asia, East Asia and Korea, where I'm from, Southeast Asia, we have a lot of transboundary problems. But I'm always amazed at the fact that when I attended the 40th anniversary of LairTap in 2018 or 19, I mean, it's already been 40 some years that the Europeans have been working together. And here in Asia, um, we need to start. I mean, we talked a lot about international cooperation and whatnot. And I think, you know, it's, um, they are, and the Europeans are, have been much ahead. They are offering to, um, offering to help. Um, there's, uh, the FICAP, the Forum on International Cooperation of, um, Air Pollution that they are launching and, and they've already launched. And I think, well, you know, we, we can, um, there's a lot of, uh, things that have already been done that we can sort of be helped with in Asia. So I think it's, again, um, very exciting to be able to accept all that. And um, continuing on with the um, program, there was supposed to be a audience um, Q&A at this point, but I think I will go to the designated, pre-designated interventions first. And if we have any questions from the audience, we'll accept it um, toward the end of the um, the. Um, session. Um, we'll have an intervention from the Philippines, uh, Mr. Ju um, Jundi Del uh, Sakaro, right? Okay, he's um, from the Air Quality Management Section Chief in Environmental Management Bureau, Department of Environment and Natural Resources. Um, intervention from the Philippines, please. Well, for the Philippine experience, um, highlighting the relative cost and benefit on taking actions. Uh, to air pollution is very helpful to policymakers. So um, we have this 20-year uh, cleaner act law, and there are um, and uh, it has this implementing rules and regulation. But what is important here is um, its action plan and framework, because during the uh, institutional strengthening. St stage of the uh, uh, Philippine Clean Air Act, uh, there are several cost and benefit uh, studies that uh, were highlighted uh, in order to give timeline to specific uh, provisions and actions related to stationary sources, the mobile sources, and the air resources. So this uh, uh, cost and benefit has highlighted how much would affect the mortality and morbidity uh, in cases of increase in particulate matter, increase in concentration per microgram per normal cubic meter of NOx, CO. So um, it's very important that uh, uh, these costs and benefits should be science-based. Um, that's why establishing uh, 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 air quality data such as uh, Air quality, ambient air quality monitoring network, um, stationary source emission testing, uh, in use motor vehicle and type of pro uh, approval monitoring system for motor vehicles. That is very for important so that uh, we could uh, uh, scientifically determine 
uh, the importance of uh, cost and benefit to human health and especially, of course, the, our economy. So um, we have uh, 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 conducted a lot of interventions from tightening the motor vehicle uh, emission standards. We are at um, Euro 4 right now. We're going to Euro 5 because in our uh, emission inventory, in our baseline, uh, it's more than 60% is uh, accounted for the transport sector. But um, we may be winning with the type of approval and, or new motor vehicles, but uh, for in-use, um, uh, the cost and benefit uh, might be hurting us because we're, st we're still recipient of the second-hand motor vehicle industry. We love our jeepney, but we don't love much its emission. Okay, so um, 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 if there's um, inaction, then probably we could highlight delayed inaction. Um, uh, there is a uh, this cost and benefit study um, with a university uh, assistance to us, De La Salle University, uh, that if we uh, modernized our uh, jeepneys into electric jeepneys or into Euro 4 efficient jeepneys, we could have uh, gained more. No, and uh, also uh, this will uh, complement policies on uh, end-of-life vehicle uh, program, um, as well as uh, uh, pro uh, providing um, uh, non-motorized means of transport. No? So every everything uh, in this study uh, will benefit the Philippines. Um, for stationary sources, um, uh, it's good that um, we have established the environmental impact assessment system, the pollution control officer system and monitoring, and of course, the permit to operate system wherein uh, requiring the monitoring of emissions from stationary sources. Um, uh, it has this uh, self-regulating effect uh, that uh, right now it's between 70 to 70 to 50 percent below the standards. However, uh, there's also challenges uh, in uh, then delayed review of the stationary source standards and ambient monitoring standards. Um, um, uh, I, we believe that um, the Philippine experience no, would be great, will be uh, move would move forward no, in the assistance of uh, partnership with uh, the scientific community, with the academe. And of course, the regional community, uh, in order to uh, address and go to our main goal, which is to attain clean air. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the following intervention is by Lao PDR. The speaker will be Mr. Vanna Fonfonga, Deputy Director of Environmental Laboratory, um, NRERI, from Lao PDR. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Chun. Uh, thank you uh, for all interesting talk we've uh, have, uh, heard so far today. It's really good to hear and learn from uh, the experience and our neighbor. I would like to give you some uh, overview. The current the current air pollution is uh, situation in Laos. Forecast uh, the science policy and interface uh, in uh, two thousand. 20, 2022, the yearly uh, average uh, concentration level, PM2.5 invention, uh, 26 microgram per cubic meter. Uh, this level pollutant achieved by five times WHO air quality standard. Uh, concentrated air, air pollution, air pollution, uh, incur, uh, a large cost, uh, to public health. And it has been uh, estimated uh, air quality, uh, it is possible for, uh, the daily, uh, six, uh, 10 percent of all this in love here. Uh, in response uh, to this uh, issue, we have, uh, developed policy and, uh, plan to reduce air pollution, including, uh, issuing, uh, the, uh, technical guidance on the meeting thrust and burn plastic. Plan to improve our uh, public transport and uh, program to list public awareness 
but we still lack uh, the data and e uh, in the event in our recent uh, national uh, pollution control strategy for uh, 2018 2000, uh, 2025 we highlight that uh, there is a lack uh, of an emission data from common pollution such as uh, particulate matter sulfur dioxide and uh, nitrogen oxide and the computation uh, of emission eventually uh, is not performed uh, routine. We have uh, therefore been working uh, with UNEP and SEI to develop uh, integrate, uh, integrated uh, mission eventually for LAPDR to qualify emission from uh, all key source sector. However, uh, we are still uh, incorporate a uh, relation with file we have also conduct to uh, temporary uh, assessment of the dynamic of uh, evolution uh, for the hotspot uh, LAPDR by taking uh, uh, available for fuel and remote sensing analysis. Uh, this uh, assessment uh, highlight for the uh, significant distance between uh, AOD and O2 and ozone with the fire. Uh, agriculture and climate indicator. Under the UNEP project that we are discussing today, we are now we could, uh, working to develop uh, mitigation assessment to understand uh, benefit of different mit uh, mitigation options uh, as well as uh, the cost associated uh, with not uh, taking action. Uh, we hope that uh, this uh, assessment will form the basic for the national uh, clean air action plan. We outline two clear, two clear set of uh, communication action for LAPDR. The, uh, the assess assessment for the all or to evaluate, evaluate how action in our existing, uh, existing plan to can reduce uh, air pollution and climate change. Uh, for example, we will, uh, to be an award to qualify for the air quality, uh, pollution benefit, uh, and climate change to, uh, form an, uh, implementing climate change, uh, emigration code outline. We have the target, uh, introduction 50,000 energy, uh, efficiency, uh, for cook stop by 2000. 30 and our mitigation assessment, uh, uh, we've helped uh, understand to how, uh, many live, uh, could be safe from the de deducting air pollution to this, uh, climate change action. As part of this project, we also participate in a training workshop next week. We've increased the capacity of, uh, ministry of National Resource Environment to undertake our uh, own integrated uh, mitigation assessment. I would like to uh, conclude uh, by sharing with you the good news that we are now received uh, from uh, Minister uh, approved for the process developing a Queen Air Action Plan in LAPDR. We look forward to continue our cooperative uh, work to uh, tracking evolution and commission with you or thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, as you can see, um, we have tried to, um, get as many representatives from the ASEAN countries as possible, some that are included in the report and some that are not. Um, obviously, there are many differences between the countries, but I think there's a lot of work to do, but um, a lot of it's been accomplished also. Our final intervention will be from the WHO, Dr. Rashid Hussein, Regional Advisor, WHO Southeast Asia Regional Office. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you all the presenters and speakers. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. I know we are uh, running out of time and I'm just uh, as the uh, final speaker in between your lunch, I'll try to make it as short as possible. 
uh, in terms of the work that uh, WHO has been doing, uh, the focus is to strengthen the recognition of air pollution as an NCD cause, including around investment cases and best buy policy options. Uh, last year, we have endorsed the Regional Action Plan for Prevention of NCDs and addressing environmental determinants, including air pollution and climate change, is one of the key priority action areas. We have also established a regional expert group on environmental determinants of health and climate change. A regional roadmap and priority research areas have been identified during March this year. I think over the last two days, uh, we have heard the various tools, including the CHEST uh, tool, technological options and existing platforms and guidelines from WHO and other stakeholders. As a member of the scientific advisory group, I must say that the national assessments that have been presented here today are a very important step forward in generating data for evidence, which was mentioned by NAPAC from uh, USAID. And the same should be scaled up and uh, methodologies and approaches can be used. And certainly we look uh, for similar opportunities in the region and we would be happy to provide a technical support to countries in the region for the same. Um, there is existing regional forum on health and environment involving countries in the Asia uh, Pacific, as mentioned, mentioned by INDA from Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia is the current chair and air pollution and climate change are two thematic areas of the regional forum. This will be a great opportunity for cooperation between environment and health in the region and also in the countries. In countries, this cooperation is strengthened through uh, NEHAP, which was one of the recommendations made by the regional forum in its first ministerial meeting in Bangkok in 2007. Uh, clean air is everyone's business and air pollution is preventable, as we have heard from many success stories during various sessions in this conference. We have heard of uh, cost of inaction, and I will not be going into details again, but I just want to highlight the fact that not only do air pollutants and greenhouse gases share the same sources, same pollutants directly contribute to global warming. And uh, reducing these pollutants will definitely slow the rate of climate change and help limit warming to 1.5 degrees. Our children and all our future generations deserve to breathe air that is free from toxic pollution and we all have a role to play. Uh, and uh, I just want to uh, bring to the attention that we all know the fact that by 2050, almost 70% of the world's population is projected to live in urban areas and only half of the world's urban population has convenient access to public transport how our cities are designed and consequently how we travel and maintain physical activities determine the quality of air we breathe as well as our health, safety and well-being. And this requires multi-sectoral support and action. What needs is to translate science into action. It's action that matters. Thanks and I'll stop here. Thank you so very much. Um, at the onset of the session, I promised you a dialogue. And as is the case with so many of these um, sessions that we're running about 10 minutes into your lunchtime, if there is one burning question that you would like to ask any of our panelists or speakers, um, we will accept one question. Anybody? You're all starving. Just one. There is. No. <laughs> okay, who raised your hand first? <laughs> yes, if there's a mic that we can, uh, yeah, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. The question is to Zig. Uh, Zig, I mean, we take example of climate change. It's a global problem. Countries are discussing it. We have COP meetings every year, and we are trying to negotiate our way to achieve a consensus. My question to you is, we are talking about transboundary pollution here. I know it's not a global issue, it's a regional issue at least. Why we never could reach that stage where countries are coming forward and discussing this, you know, their negotiated responsibilities to achieve or to reduce their own contributions to reduce overall regional level air pollution. I know in EU, you have a good examples. What were the enablers there where uh, you know uh, countries can learn lessons from. So that's my precise question to think. Thanks. Thank you very much. Our lunch has been just postponed by another 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's only to start the discussion. I think it's a million dollar question really, or a few million dollar question. As, um, 
you know, we've been pondering how to translate some of the success stories in the EU, well, not EU, actually, in Europe, from the convention to other regions. And Asia Pacific, Northeast Asia, you maybe heard yesterday, there's, the room was packed with, uh, with Asian group discussing also the, the, the politically signed and accepted now agreement to collaborate on pollution, which is a great success. Actually, Sangmin, I don't know if he's around here, but this is, he's also personal. I would like to congratulate him for that because he's been fighting for that for very long. And this is a great example, actually of how it can go to to um, capitalize on some of the experience that is out there. I personally, and I'm biased, see science really as one of the elements, one of the parts of part, one of the elements of the puzzle that helped to move the agenda um, from, you know, only scientific funding uh, findings to actually political agenda. We wonder ourselves in Europe, how did it happen that some of the tools and models that were not designed for policy people made it actually and and continue supporting the discussion? It's great, but I don't know if there's a recipe that would actually work for everyone. I think we need to find our own sensitivities and our own opportunities. There's a lot that is out there already we can learn from. And I think we have great examples of institutions, WHO, putting the guidelines up there. We have actually, you know, light in many tunnels. There are actually many tunnels, but in some of them, there's a light, there's a guideline. It's not regulation, but it tells you what the consequences are if you don't follow the light. And I think cost of inaction or discussion of transboundary aspect of air pollution or equity, gender issues, these are all different lights that we can follow. And I think they resonate in a very different way in different regions, not only because we are at this different stage of development, but also of the importance, also cultural and political importance of some of these elements is unevenly distributed across the continents. But there is something for all of us in this big part of, uh, you know, in all of this, the tunnel with a lot of lights. Just have to find our way to get out of it. And I'm optimistic because I see a lot of discussion actually uh, happening really around around the planet. Thank you very much. And enjoy your lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Vic. Um, I'm afraid that we are out of time. If you have any other questions, um, please ask them during lunch to any of our speakers and panelists. I've tried to refrain from giving summaries because I wanted to give more time to speakers, but if you bear with me for just one minute, um, there's a lot of um, things that we as scientists, or at least you know, most of the scientists on this panel, um, try to tell policymakers. And sometimes we get so stuck with these um, scientific aspects, and I like to talk about just communication, the importance of communication, and sometimes the delivering the message of scientific facts is more an art than, you know, a science. Um, knowing what to do, how to phrase it. For example, the International Day of Clean Air for Blue Skies, where the, the target is the public. So how do we make um, the words easier for them to understand? When I first heard the word epistemic community, I honestly have to tell you, I didn't know what that meant. I had to look it up in the dictionary. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do better communicating wise. So again, I think this cost of inaction, it's going to perk the ears of a lot of the policymakers. And I think it's a good start. And one good news is that um, this is the end of the session. But in the afternoon, we're going to have another session from the CCAC um, SLCP perspective of cost of inaction. Um, is Nathan around? He's not, but he'll be organizing the afternoon session. It's going to be in the same location starting at two o'clock. So we hope that many of you will be come to that session also. And I also like to thank, um, uh, Tom, Tom. Yeah, for organizing the session. Um, this was really a nice job, I think, if I can say so myself. So thank you, all the panelists and all the speakers. Thank you very much and enjoy your lunch. <laughs>